folks. How are you? Thank you for listening. Good to have you here. Thank you to Delaney Feltis, young lady, Troy's daughter. Troy is a stand-up Dominic listener, subscriber. Delaney often joins us at our Thursday night hangouts where it's adult, sometimes saying really inappropriate things and cool parents who really just don't care and bring their kids. Thank you, Delaney. That was awesome. If you or your kid wants to record an opening for the show, an introduction like that, send it my way. That was great. I'd love to have more of them. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. Very happy to have you here on a Monday. It is the first show, first episode of Stand Up in the month of May. I hope you had a great weekend. It's May 3rd as I tape this. Stand Up with Pete Dominic Daily, bringing you the best guest experts, analysts, and all around interesting folks I can find each and every day because I got a long list and it's always growing. Let me know who you want to hear on the program today. Dr. Merton Running Wolf will join me to talk about Rick Santorum's comments about Native Americans, lack of a contribution to American culture, racism in America, and more. Great conversation with Mert coming your way. Thank you to everybody who reached out to me because I begged you to reach out to me on Friday, which was the day after I got my second vaccine, my second dose of the old Moderna juice, the old Moderna smoothie, and the old arm ski. I did good. Did good. I mean, I didn't have any major side effects. I was lethargic, so I didn't really do anything on Friday. I just kind of sat around, which was super weird. I watched that uh, Amazon Prime Tom Clancy movie with the uh, the beautiful Michael B. Jordan. It was pretty good. What is it? Without remorse or some something? I don't know. And then I Saturday I went up and met my childhood BFF Alex Ciota, who is a Virologist, actually. Virologist. I can't say that word. Up in Albany at the Wadsworth Center working for the state of New York studying mosquito-borne viruses. And while we haven't seen each other, I we, we met when we were seven years old on my street. We were neighbors growing up, and we were best friends and still are. And I haven't seen him since the pandemic uh, broke out. And so that was great. We met in between... Saratoga, where he lives, and just north of New York City, where I live, and we went zip lining at Hunter Mountain, and it was a lot of fun. We hung out, we had some drinks, we had some good food, we went for a little hike at the Catterskill Falls. It was fantastic. I hope you had a great weekend. Hope you got outside. Thank you for the vitamin N pictures. So many of you sent me them over the weekend, but I can always use more. Take pictures of nature, send them to me, make sure they don't include any man-made objects if possible. I accept some that don't. And then I I throw them in at the daily email for all of the Stand Up with Pete Dominic subscribers, which if you are not, today is your day, ladies and gentlemen. It's the beginning of May, and I would love to have you sign up for $5 or more. All kinds of really cool benefits that you get being a member of the Stand Up Pete Dominic community. And mostly, you get to support a great independent media show. And I can't do it without you because it's free, but it ain't cheap. This is a daily podcast. It is my full-time gig, pretty much. So I hope that you will sign up and support the podcast with a paid subscription. Go to the paid subscription link in the show notes or go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. All right. It is Monday. It is time to get to the last 24, and on Mondays, I kind of look back at the whole weekend where we lost a legend, Olympia Dukakis, who's an Academy Award-winning actress, passed away at the age of 89, also had the Kentucky Derby. Did you did you watch that? I didn't really know that it was happening, because I think horse racing is awful and not entertaining also, but uh, apparently that was a thing that happened over the weekend, and so much more. So let's get to the last 24. <laughs> A horrific accident uh, and fatal stampede in Israel, which marked a national day of mourning on Sunday in the wake of this awful event at a religious festival on Friday that killed 45 people, including children, injured more than 150 others. That's why I never like to be in big crowds. I mean, it's kind of an irrational concern, but like a lot of these religious the uh, pilgrimages, the Hajj or uh, all these different ones that happen in the different religions that I can't name off the top of my head. Oh, uh, 
scare the hell out of me, the idea of being with all those people. Yikes. I'll stay in the shed worshipping the devil. Just kidding, folks. You know I am only a believer and lover of nature. Nature is my god. Which is why I'll probably fall out of a tree or get eaten by a ferocious animal and end up in a peat code jingle for the news dump. Three people, including the suspect, were killed at a casino shooting in Wisconsin at the Oneida Casino near Green Bay on Saturday night. The suspect was killed by police. Investigators believe that the suspect was targeting an employee at a restaurant in the hotel attached to the casino who he had a personal relationship with. But the employee wasn't there and said... He just shot the person's co-workers and friends. Absolutely horrific event in our very violent, gun-loving country. SpaceX's crew, Dragon Resilience, carrying four astronauts back to Earth from the International Space Station, splashed down safely just before 3 a.m. on Sunday morning off the coast of Panama City. The first nighttime splashdown for NASA astronauts since the return of Apollo 8 in 1968. And speaking of space, here is SpaceX CEO Elon Musk uh, being interviewed by X Prize founder Peter Diamandis. Uh, and he's sitting there in his bare feet and his marble mouth stupidity. And I'm no fan of Elon Musk, in case you haven't heard. And uh, he's hosting Saturday Night Live this weekend, if you could believe it, and just tweeted out requests for people's sketch ideas. Really? Anyway, he told the X Prize founder Peter Diamandis. Uh, that getting to people to, to Mars is going to be dangerous and that people are probably going to die, but it's necessary in order to ensure survival of humanity. Here it is with a little weird music under it. I didn't put it in there. Honestly, a bunch of people probably will die in the beginning. It's, <laughs> it's tough sledding over there. You We're know? an exploring Psycho. species. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, for we don't want to make anyone go. So it's like, <laughs> volunteers only. I think it's important for the long term uh preservation and, and ultimately the expansion and extension of the, the, the scope and scale of consciousness uh, and the long term uh, probably a survival of humanity and life as we know it, we must become a multi-planet species uh, because there are all these risks that we can't control yeah, existential risks, there's all these asteroid existential strikes risks. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there's like super volcanoes, and we could do, a, a, you know, we have World War 3, it's a glorious adventure and uh, it'll be amazing an, an amazing experience, and your name will go in history yes, you might not, <laughs> it's going to be uncomfortable and that's, we probably won't have good food and uh, all these things, you know <laughs> so, so yeah. if, 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 if an arduous and dangerous journey where you may not come back alive um but it's a glorious adventure sounds appealing and Mars you still is the place. and that's you still the have that's the thousands of, of volunteers if not millions of volunteers who would yeah. want to go he's a psycho i'm sorry i don't know i'm not a fan are you guys a fan of him does anybody like elon musk as a person he, not good at talking he's not he's not good at delivering words succinctly or eloquently anyway moving on Let's get to poor Mitt Romney, huh? A motion to censure the senator from Utah, former governor of Massachusetts and former Republican nominee for president, failed after a 798 to 711 vote by delegates to Utah's GOP convention, according to the Salt Lake Tribune. Romney, the lone GOP senator to vote to convict former President Trump in both of his impeachment trials, has faced criticism within the party for the votes and he was at this event with the Utah Republican Party over the weekend and got booed. Listen to this sad, sad moment. So what do you think about President Biden's first hundred days? Now, you know me as a person who, uh, who says what he thinks, and I don't hide the fact that I wasn't a fan of our last president's character issues. He said, aren't you embarrassed to somebody? No, no, you should be. They hate you. I mean, according to that vote, uh, the, the, the minorities overall, but it was close, were the ones that were booing the guy. But the best response I saw to that was at a certain point, you have to let go of the fantasy that the Republican Party wants to be saved. And I guess let's call this the Republican senator chunk of the last 24, because several of them were on the Sunday shows 
trying to be critical of the infrastructure bill and lie uh, about or re- not relitigate the uh, January 6th insurrection and election. And let's start first with Martha Raddatz calling out Wyoming Senator John Barroso for getting his numbers wrong. This from ABC's This Week. The problem is, of course, with President Biden's proposal. Only 6% of the money actually goes for roads and bridges. And they have more money for electric cars than they do for all of those other things. Senator, Senator, I got to stop you there. There, The 6% for roads and bridges figures you and other GOP leaders have cited has been fact-checked multiple times. The total amount for what you have called traditional infrastructure, roads, bridges, rails, airports, waterways, public transit, is more than 25% of the Biden plan. So do you want more? Well, what we're working with in this, Shelley talked to President Biden Thursday. I've been working regularly with uh, with the other Joe and powerful Joe in Washington, Joe Manchin, and we're fo- focusing on core infrastructure. Good job by whatever. Good job by uh, Martha Raddatz in that moment. And it's John Barroso. Did I say Barroso? Oh, who cares? Who really cares? These guys just lie up and down. Uh, And they're acting like this isn't going to be good for their states, for their constituents. And at the same time, they're also taking credit for it. Congresswoman uh, Elise Stefanik of upstate New York, uh, north of where I grew up, is taking credit for a big project that her district is getting. Nancy Pelosi called her out on Twitter over the weekend and uh, and quoted her uh, congratulating the district for this project and said, you voted no and took the dough or something like that, I think is great. I mean, the slam is not that she's taking credit for a project that will go a long way to help her constituents, but that she voted against because Republicans have no shame. None. Except for Mitt Romney. He has like a tiny bit and he got booed for it. (laughs) All right. Now I'll come back to Republican senators line in a moment. But first, I want to go to the CNN where uh, they have new polling showing that a majority of Republicans are still believing in the big lie about the 2020 election. Here is CNN's. For some reason, Irish reporter who does good work, Donnie O'Sullivan, talking about that polling and also talking to Trump supporters who just doesn't buy the reality of the outcome of the election, of course. Seventy percent, 70 percent of Republicans do not believe that Joe Biden uh, had enough votes to win the presidency, that he that he didn't legitimately uh, win the election, essentially. I mean, it's really quite remarkable when you think uh, when you see that number, Um, as you mentioned in Arizona right now. Votes have been checked and checked and checked again. This so-called audit, which has been described as farcical, essentially, even by Republican election officials in that state, is still giving Trump supporters, some Trump supporters online and offline, uh, the false sense of hope that the election could still be overturned. I met one uh, this week in Texas. Have a listen. Were you disappointed when Trump lost the election? Uh, I was uh, disappointed in the the lack of truth and the... uh and the election fraud that took place within it. And it's, it's coming out right now in Arizona, and it's going to be a domino effect to the truth that's moving forward. What happens after that, I don't know, but I know that the truth is there's only so many uh, voters that are in one county that can vote, and the numbers far exceed that. It's common sense mathematics. But you, there, you, there's no way now that the 2020 election result could change, right? Uh, I'm, I'm not making that call. It's not my call. But uh, if, if we'll see what the uh, institution decides once the truth comes out. And Jim, look, this is silly stuff, frankly. I mean, but it can't be ignored, unfortunately. These are the exact same conspiracy theories that helped fuel the January 6th insurrection. Yes, still so, so important and so relevant right now that This many Republican voters believe all kinds of crazy conspiracy theories led by the former president of the United States. Well, CNN's Pamela Brown was not having it from Senator Roger Marshall, and she was using that polling to try to get his response. She asks him three times to answer questions about his objection to the election results, his role in the perpetuating the big lie. Listen to this. I, I, I'm going to give you the whole, I think it's like three minutes. 
So we were speaking about a misinformation and a recent CNN poll found that 70 percent of Republicans continue to believe in the lie that this election, the last election, was stolen. You voted to toss out millions of votes in Arizona and Pennsylvania. You also joined on to the Texas lawsuit attempting to throw out votes uh, cast in four states. I'm curious, looking back, do you have any regrets about your actions and any concern that that they contributed to misinformation about the election? Look, Pamela, it's, it's, we're just so ready to move on. I made a decision based upon the facts that I knew at that point in time. I was concerned then, and I still am today, that six states broke their own laws or their own constitution. But it's time to move on. It's time for this country to heal. It's time for a spirit of forgiveness to be happening. It's time for this country to work together and, and focus on the goals that we can solve together. We've got plenty of challenges right now. We're making great progress coming out of this uh, COVID virus. The economy's bounced back. It's time to move on. It's time to move on. And I see your point there. But also, um, it's also important to hold people, lawmakers accountable for, for their actions. And this obviously was was a decision that you had made. And I'm just curious as as, um, as we try to move on, but also uh, look at the ripple effect from what happened there with the election. How does those actions, how do those actions square with your Republican values as, um, you know, limited government, states rights, federalism? How does that line up with wanting to throw out millions of votes, advocating for millions of votes to be thrown out in several states. Yeah, you know, Pamela, we want we want voting to be easier, cheating to be harder. So I think what by us standing up to our concerns about that, those elections, about the election integrity, is force those states with their problems to come back to the table and have those legislatures work together to make make sure we had safer elections with higher integrity. Again, making it easier to vote but harder to cheat. So in my heart, I did what I thought was the right thing, and I think the country's moving in a better direction. Okay, and I'm just going to press one more time on that, and then I know we we do have to move on. But the Constitution gives the states rights to certify the results. These states, Arizona and Pennsylvania, did certify the results. Um, that is what the Constitution allows. But you had voted to to throw out those votes that that they had certified. So again, I'm just curious how it aligns with your views as a Republican on states' rights. Look, you know, this is not just necessarily a Republican issue. Democrats have done the same thing. I think they're every election since 2000. Look, if I think a cheat, that a state cheated, that they broke their own laws, their own constitution, I, somebody has to stand up and push back on them. But there was no evidence of widespread fraud, as you well know, from both sides of the aisle. People said that there was no evidence of it. So, so what, what no. were you basing that on? based upon that they broke their own laws in their own constitution. Um, so therefore, we don't know how much fraud or cheating there was or wasn't. All I ever asked for is let's get all the evidence into one room at the same time and have this discussion so that elections, so we could restore election integrity once again. And right now, America doesn't have much faith in the election process that, and, or much faith in the integrity. But but do you see why a big reason they wouldn't is because lawmakers, elected officials were coming out and questioning it and sowing doubt when the, the courts were the ones, the, all these laws, as you well know, they had been litigated. They went through the court system and so forth. So you may not have liked them. You may have said, well, this isn't, you know, reflect that the legislature didn't do that. It was the the um, elected, you know, executives in these states that, that made these rule changes. I don't like that. But it was all litigated. So does it concern you that so many Americans still don't have faith? Um, based on, on the actions and rhetoric from elected leaders. You know, Pamela, we're kind of going in a, in a circular argument, and I'm not, you know, wanting to make this an argument. I, I stand beside what I said, that I thought that there was, there was um, fraud from the standpoint that the states didn't follow their own constitution and their own laws. Somebody has to stand up and say that's not right, and I felt like it was my job to do that. Okay, and of course, as you well know, um, there were there were other states too that Trump won, and those states weren't contested, which also raises the question of of why that was done. But sorry, it is my job too as a journalist to to look sure. into these things, to ask, hold officials sure. accountable, and so I hope that you can respect where I'm coming from as well. I think I need a a drop of Mitt Romney saying, "Aren't you embarrassed for all of these Republicans who are continuing?" to spread all kinds of false, twisted bullshit and misleading so many of their supporters and voters at the same time. And nowhere is that happening more right now than in Arizona. I hope that you're following that story where they're doing 
an illegitimate audit, or as it's being called, a fraud it. Ha! And of course, President Biden won Arizona with 50.1% of the votes versus 47.7% for former President Donald Trump. But this fraud it is being led by, I'm sure you know a, a lot about this story. Did you know that in addition to recounting these ballots by hand, they're now also running them under an ultraviolet light? Because that's what the, the QAnon conspiracy theorist said, that there was, there was some, going to be some kind of uh, watermark here. Anyway, over the weekend, the best of the Sunday shows, Velshi, I think, he had the former attorney general of Arizona, Grant Woods, who's not even a Republican anymore. I just thought this was great. Outside the false equivalency that there are crazy conspiracy theorists in Congress that are also Democrats, that that was bullshit. And I hate when that happens. But the rest of this, I really liked how he explains it and takes a look at. What's happened to his former party and in his state of Arizona with this fraud? It would switch party affiliation from Republican to Democrat in 2018. And Grant, of course, I'm uh, I'm, I'm honored and, and thankful that you get up so early for us. It's quite early where you are. Uh, but what a thing that's going on in Arizona. Uh, we've seen a lot of silly things going on with respect to vote counting in states. But the Arizona thing seems to cross a few lines in terms of um, uh, access to, to reporters to cover it, in terms of the idea that the rules have been set by a company, not a government, not elected officials, uh, and in terms of the fact that the head of that company seems to support the big lie of an, a stolen election. Um, it, 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 it's good to see you, Howie. Uh, last time I was with you, you were standing out in the middle of the desert with a cowboy hat on, right. freezing, <laughs> sun was coming up, and, and I told you, what did I tell you? I said, write it down, Joe Biden's going to win Arizona. Um, well, right. I don't know. These people, the, these people just uh, can't get over it. They lost, uh, you know, in every election somebody loses and uh, most people uh, can take it and some people can't. So this is I agree with you. This is totally uh, over the line. It's totally out of control. Um, these are the, these are not just look, I was I have been a lifelong Republican uh, until Trump. And we've always had uh, a few of these people, as do the Democrats, who were on the fringe. And they're, they're pretty wacky. And, uh, you know, they they were on the fringe. Uh, now they're in charge. Now they're there front and center. I mean, this has been uh, uh, sponsored primarily by the president of the Arizona Senate. And obviously uh, she has the support of, of uh, uh, her fellow Republicans there. Uh, they, they've taken the old state fairgrounds where I've gone every year there to go, uh, uh, you know, ride some probably unsafe rides and uh, play carnival games that are half of them are rigged. And uh, they fit right in there, I'll have to say. And uh, they bring in this company. You can't, you can't make it up. You know, the, the ninjas are here. Uh, yesterday, Ali, Ali, it was exposed uh, by the Arizona Republic reporter who was allowed in briefly that uh, one of the people counting votes is this guy, former Representative Kern uh, from Arizona. Um, now, just take a look at this to show you how crazy it is. Uh, this guy has been totally wacky on every crazy election theory possible. He was there on January 6th. He's an insurrectionist. He was at the rally. There's footage of him at the Capitol. And uh, he was also on the ballot, uh, and he lost. And there was a photo. There he was yesterday. He's one of the ones counting ballots. Uh, he had a pen in hand. Uh, so this is an unbiased uh, count to see, make sure everything was fair. And you have one of the insurrectionists who is looking at his own name on a ballot. The whole thing is a sham. And all I can tell you is, um, uh, oh, by the way, the Arizona Republic reporter, uh, after they reported that, was ushered out, kicked out of the uh, arena. I mean, that analysis and his take is just great outside of his point that there are Democrats that are on the fringe. There aren't. I mean, some radical theories, but they don't believe in things that aren't happening and don't not believe in things that are happening. And I think that's one of the big differences. OK, also on this Arizona issue, Cindy McCain was on CNN with Jake Tapper here she is. So let me ask you Thank just you. about see you. this bizarre episode going on in your home state six months after the election. Republicans <laughs> in Arizona doing something. It's just downright bizarre. They brought in a guy who's an election liar to lead an audit of ballots from Maricopa County, even though the election board there is led by Republicans. 
They're using ultraviolet light and other methods to examine ballots, looking for evidence of voter fraud. Obviously, the same lie that fueled the January 6th attack on the Capitol. What do you make of all this? Is the Arizona Republican Party undermining democracy? Oh, I, listen, the whole thing is ludicrous. Quite frankly, it's ludicrous. Um, and this also comes from a state party in Arizona that refused to be audited themselves on votes that were cast within their own party communications. So, uh, you know, it, it's it, the election is over. Biden won. Uh, I know many of them d don't like the outcome, but, you know, elections have consequences. And so I, I you know, this does not surprise me, uh, you know. The, things are just aloof and crazy out there right now with regards to the election. <laughs> Quite a contrast. All right. So I am not going to stop paying attention to what's going on out there in Arizona. Arizona Republic newspaper is doing real good work. Follow the local journalists out there and just wait, because I mean, are they going to actually say that Donald Trump won the Arizona election? Is that what this crazy outfit is going to try to do? Well, we will see. What happens out there for sure. OK, and let's go back to Republican senators and that new reporting from the CNN poll about how many the vast majority of Republican voters do not believe in the election outcome. So CBS News, John Dickerson had Senator Tim Scott on CBS Face the Nation, and he asked this problem, this question. It's such an important question. It isn't going anywhere until they start telling the truth themselves. And of course, Senator Tim Scott doesn't answer John Dickerson's very important and very relevant question. I want to get your your you on the record about one final thing, if I may, Senator. You talked about yes, having sir. an honest conversation and about common sense and common ground. Seventy percent of your, your party Absolutely. think that Joe Biden is illegitimate because the election was stolen. How do you have common ground with that belief? Well, by moving on, with the, the election is over. Joe, Joe Biden is a president of the United the States. The legitimate president. And now what we have to wrestle with, of course he is. Well, now what we have to wrestle with is, can we spend six to six and a half trillion dollars and raise taxes by four to four and a half trillion dollars and create a better America? My All answer right, is no, because oh, the American government to. can't be responsible for everything. I mean, it's such an important question. We can't get past this, the election. To get to negotiating anything else important in terms of legislation or any policy changes, not that we ever could because it's not like there is a an equal partner, a legitimate and honest partner that just has differences. They're, they're, they're bad faith actors. But the point is, how do you negotiate with people who just don't believe any of the baseline truths? It's such a great question by John Dickerson to Tim Scott, and it needs to be keep being asked just that way to those in power uh, that are in the Republican Party in Congress. And ever since Tim Scott said the the other night after in his response to Joe Biden that America is not a racist country, we've been trying to answer that question and talk about that question. And my friend Tiffany Cross over on MSNBC, her show, The Cross Connection, she just decided not to hold back at all. I mean, this is borderline mean. And I'm not going to sit here and make fun of Tim Scott because he's a black guy and I'm not going to decide uh, what he should or shouldn't be believing. I'm not going to harass him and call him an Uncle Tom like so many other people have. I don't feel comfortable doing that, but I will watch real smart black folks who I respect do it. And Tiffany Cross lays into Tim Scott so hard, I'm almost surprised MSNBC let her do it. It was that mean. I'm going to play the whole rant for you. Here it is from her show this past weekend. This clip starts with her throwing, uh, coming out of a clip from the great Michael Harriet at The Root. Can anyone name a political, social, or economic institution in America where widespread disparities and discrimination does not exist? Don't worry. I'll wait. <laughs> I love that guy. Such a great question from my friend, The Roots, Michael Harriet, and I actually have an answer. The hollow institution that resides inside Republican Senator Tim Scott's head. No racism there, and apparently no sense either. This week, the sole black Republican in the Senate sounded a stone fool when he said this. Hear me clearly. America is not a racist country. Okay, 
Let's be clear. Tim Scott does not represent any constituency other than the small number of sleepy, slow-witted sufferers of Stockholm Syndrome who get elevated to prominence for repeating a false narrative about this country that makes conservative white people feel comfortable. Because when you speak an uncomfortable truth, like Nicole Hannah-Jones, the party that Scott's claims is not racist gets big mad and tries to silence you. Just this week, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell asked Education Secretary Miguel Cardona to scrap teaching the 1619 Project in schools because it would reorient the view of American history. Lucky for McConnell, he has his own tap dancer to try and reorient the view of America for him. There were so many contradictions in the senator's speech that it was clear not even Scott believed the words he was speaking. I could go into great detail refuting each of his asinine points, but he did that for me. And moreover, a lesson I've learned, don't argue with people Harriet Tubman would have left behind. And sure, Tim Scott has spoken out about his encounters with law enforcement and he co-sponsored the anti-lynching bill in the Senate, but there are two sides to every token. So thirsty for white approval, this dude actually stood on the national stage to defend the voter suppression law in Georgia, even though, as of last month, 361 bills were being introduced in 47 states to keep people who look like him out of the ballot box. The ability to shame the ancestors and appease the oppressors all in one speech, that's extreme. Though not quite like the domestic violent extremism that the Department of Homeland Security is investigating within its own ranks, mind you. But please, Senator, say more about how unracist the country is while you trot out that tired line about going from cotton to Congress to clown. Perhaps this was merely Senator Scott's audition to be Sam Jackson's understudy in the film Django, because as a descendant of the enslaved and damn near a daily survivor of institutional racism, I can assure you the question, is America a racist country, is one that has been asked and answered many times over. Yet we still love America, not for what it was, but for what it could be. On this one, you're not only on the wrong side of the aisle, Senator Scott, but you're embarrassingly on the wrong side of history as well. Oh, my Lord. I'm not sure I've seen a commentator or pundit on a mainstream cable or news outlet destroy the character of a senator, a sitting senator, that harshly in a very long time. Tiffany Cross leaving it all on the field. Let's stay on this issue and go back to Velshi, however, uh, who asked historian and New Yorker writer Jelani Cobb, what are some people so afraid of when it comes to facing our country's darker origins? I get into this with my own guest here, Dr. Merton Runningwolf, coming up in just a moment. But here is Jelani Cobb on Velshi. It does divide society. It did divide society. It actually launched a civil war. Why would we want to be covering this up? You know, I think that, you know, first off, to Aaron's point, then I have to say that if I was knowledgeable about knowledgeable about these issues, it was because I was a beneficiary of the very fine history department at Howard University and the very fine graduate history program at Rutgers University uh, that made it very clear uh, that we have these narratives of history in the United States uh, that are not meant to be a resume, <laughs> that history is not the same thing as you know, the kind of list of all the right. wonderful right. attributes about you. Uh, and so we had to tell the entire narrative. And so the slanted thing here, is, you know, to use their, their term, is that they're attempting to keep the most biased version of history as the, the most accurate form of it. Uh, and so the fact of the matter is, we have a constitution that enshrined and protected slavery. That when we look at the origins of this country again and again in the Declaration of Independence and our founding documents and our early legislatures, the terms of the issues of slavery and the protection and extension of slavery come up again and again and again. The fundamental war, the foundational war of this country, the war in which we lost the most casualties by far was fought over the question of whether or not people would be allowed to buy, sell, uh, traffic, abuse, rape, and exploit African Americans. Uh, and so this country has been steeped and defined, and we could kind of talk about this all morning. It doesn't mean that we're, we're required to stay in that place, but unless we have, are able to have an honest conversation about the origins of this country and the way that it relates 
to George Floyd dying before our eyes last year and the disparities we see in uh, birth mortalities and the disparities we see in COVID mortalities and all these other kinds of dynamics that are with us right now, the only way we can begin to address those things is to be honest about how we came to them in the first place. All right. Well, we are going to get into some of that in my conversation with Dr. Merton Running Wolf coming up. But I want to finally move on to uh, COVID related headlines. I've got a couple just quick clips to play for you. But first of all, good news. 100 million Americans have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19. White House COVID-19 coordinator Jeff Zients Zients said Friday that 100 million Americans have now been fully vaccinated against COVID-19, nearly double 55 million Americans who have been fully vaccinated as of the end of March. So that's really good news. The Biden administration announced they would restrict travel from India amid the COVID-19 surge there uh, beginning May 4th in light of extraordinary high COVID-19 case loads and multiple variants circulating there. The White House confirmed this on Friday. The policy won't apply to American citizens. And in India is where we find our next guest, who is a Washington Post opinion writer. And she had a, a very powerful commentary on Velshi, going back one more time to the great well of his guests on MSNBC. Here is Barka Dutt on Velshi from India, where at least 211,000 people have died. She's been on the front lines covering the pandemic in India. And just this week, the story hit very close to home. Barka, thank you for being with us this morning. Tell us what the situation is, please. Thank you, Ali, for having me. And yes, as you said, the news came home for me this week. I was just telling a friend that like an oncologist who gets cancer or a dermatologist who battles skin disease, I became the story I've been reporting for 15 months when I lost my father in his 80s to COVID. Uh, Though being of relative privilege in this country, I was able to provide for him health care, get him a hospital bed uh, and the best medical treatment. Just to get him to hospital uh, was a nightmare to find a private ambulance. Uh, not the hospitals, but because the hospital was overstretched and busy, but the ambulance that came was a rickety old car. Its uh, cylinder did not have the mask it needed to to administer the oxygen properly. My father's levels plummeted perilously by the time we reached hospital and we lost him. When we went to cremate him, like so many other families I've been reporting on, and I'm seeing those images of the cremations that you're playing on your screen, there wasn't space at the cremation ground. We had to seek the help of the police to cremate him. I wish I could tell you that this is only my story, but the truth is that my story, despite the crushing personal loss, Ali, is a lot luckier than what hundreds of thousands of Indians are going through, who are literally feeling that the state has abandoned them, that they've been left to fend for themselves. I meet them dying on the streets at hospital doors that are shutting uh, their gates. Uh, We have had in this capital minutes ago, eight people die in an ICU because the oxygen ran out. We have repeated deaths casualties because there's a shortage of oxygen and as one doctor told me that's not dying from COVID that's murder to make matters worse people are being made to sign consent forms before they get a bed if they're lucky enough to get a bed to basically wave off any liability for the hospital if it does not have oxygen or a ventilator this is not the fault of our heroic frontline workers Ali they're they're, they've been pushed to the limit, but they have been betrayed by a government and by a policy that dropped its ball on preparing for the second wave. And we're seeing today what was meant to be a big vaccine rollout for Indians. There aren't even enough vaccines to go around. This is a humanitarian catastrophe, and I urge the world to pay more attention to it. Urging the world to pay more attention to what is happening in India. That's award-winning journalist, opinion columnist, The Washington Post, Barka Dutt on the front lines covering the pandemic in India on MSNBC's Velshi. Okay, lastly, what I've got for you is disgraced former general Mike Flynn, who over the weekend showed up at a pro-Trump rally in South Carolina, an event called Bikers for Trump that was held at the Honky Tonk Saloon. And it was sponsored by uh, this Lynn Wood nut job who just said he was in the White House and that Trump is still there and is at the Oval Office. He just tweeted pictures out of, of Trump still in the Oval Office. They're just old pictures of Trump in the old uh, Oval Office. Anyway, 
Mike Flynn has completely disgraced himself, his family, and the Flynn name. I mean, anybody named Flynn. My friend comedian Kevin Flynn should be embarrassed by Michael Flynn. And he did even more of it when he appears to forget the words of the Pledge of Allegiance. But don't worry, he always forgets, like, the QAnon mantra. But he forgot the words of the pledge here. Take a listen. Listen, I'm going to say the Pledge of Allegiance. You're going to say it along with me. I mean, he made a huge deal out of listening to the words and take your hat off and really tune in to what I'm saying as I forget the pledge. All right. Well, that was a big, long opening news segment, and I still have a news dump for you. And then my guest, Dr. Merton Running Wolf, coming up. But here we go. It's time for everything else that I can find. It's your news dump with another great jingle from listener subscriber Pete Coe. NRA president, elephant hunting chump. We hope he's gored by tusks on today's news dump. Yes! Yes! Get him! Oh, that was awesome, Pete. Thank you. I actually requested uh, that an elephant kill Wayne LaPierre in a news dump jingle. So you nailed it again, Pete. Thank you very much. Oh, terrible news coming out of San Diego. The San Diego uh, Union Tribune reporting late on Sunday night or early evening, I should say. Three people died and more than two dozen were hospitalized when a boat capsized near San Diego. Officials say they suspected the boat was smuggling people into the U.S. It is a dangerous, dangerous journey to try to get into this country. Apparently, 27 people were hospitalized with varying degrees of injuries. Emergency crews were called around 10.30 Sunday morning. Lifeguards pulled people out of the water, some of whom needed CPR. Just crazy what happened out there. Terrible situation. Let's take a moment to be grateful for all that we have. And all that I have is more news for you in the news dump, none of which is going to be nearly as horrific as that, I promise. English soccer fans demanding the removal of Manchester United's American owners stormed the field on Sunday before the game against Liverpool, causing its postponement. About 10,000 protesters carrying signs and flares gathered at a team hotel as well as Old Trafford, which which is the stadium. And uh, the Premier League game was postponed and police dispersed the crowd uh, around the scheduled start time. This is a pretty interesting story, what's happening over there. You don't see that type of a protest over a decision that professional sports teams make here in America. I don't think we take anything as seriously as the British take soccer, but what the hell do I know? Well, this is good news. Uh, A new poll saying the country is pretty optimistic after Joe Biden's first 100 days. Nearly two thirds of Americans say the country is headed in the right direction. Sixty four percent are optimistic about the direction of the country in the new poll. And in a somewhat related story, household income soared a record 21 percent in the month of March, according to the Commerce Department on Friday. Oh, and here's more good news. The Biden administration canceled the border wall projects initiated by former President Donald Trump and uh, is giving the money back to the Department of Defense. He shouldn't have. He should have taken that $10 billion and given it to any number of the other programs that he's working on. The Department of Defense has enough money, according to me. A lawmaker in Oregon who opened the state capitol, like literally opened the door to far right protesters, is now facing charges. Oregon State Rep Mike Neerman, who is a uh, Republican there, allowed far right demonstrators to breach the capitol in December. And now he is facing criminal charges. Good. I mean, at what job would you let people break into your job? Would you open the door for them? There's not too many. You know, that you would sneak people in that want to do damage at your company, at your business, at your place of work. Just that whether you're a teacher or you work at a TV station or in the Capitol, it's just a a, a terrible thing that he did. Of course, what would he possibly thinking? 
All right, the TSA is extending the mask mandate aboard flights through summer as travel increases. NPR says wearing a face mask will continue to be a requirement at airports, aboard commercial flights, and on other public transportation across the country through the summer. The federal mask mandate, which is set to expire on May 11th, is going to now remain in effect through September 13th, according to updated guidance issued by the TSA. I'm fine. I don't know about it. And finally, like I said at the top of the show, this is the first episode of May. And May 1st, of course, is May Day, and protests surge in cities around the world for May Day as demonstrators call for better working protections and other causes. They come as COVID-19 and a stumbling economy continues to disrupt the world. Again, looking at NPR's reporting and reading from it, May 1st marks International Labor Day, which commemorates laborers and the working class. Marches and demonstrations typically occur every year in many countries, but took on a new meaning after a year of lockdowns affecting many workers' livelihoods. In Paris, at least 17,000 people gathered, many of them to oppose a change in government unemployment benefits. I'm going to try to get to uh, Rick Smith, who is a a labor leader and broadcaster, and uh, try to get him on this week to talk about what's going on with the American labor movement. Always an interesting guest. And that is it for tonight, today, whenever time you're listening, News Dump. Thank you very much. You know what? One more story, because this has helped me get into my guest, Merton Running Wolf. He is a member of the Blackfeet Nation. And and uh, before I introduce him, just a, a, a story about the Blackfeet in the news I saw today. They have shared their COVID vaccines with Canadians. Yeah, Canadian news reporting the Canadian U.S. border near Cardston was flooded with people hoping to get their hands on either a Pfizer or Moderna COVID-19 vaccine. Blackfeet Nation has vaccinated the vast majority of its members and has since decided to share some of the world's most sought-after substances with Canadians who have been waiting to get either their first or second shot. And roughly 750 people were vaccinated in a similar effort last week for members of the Blackfoot Confederacy and residents of Cardston. Anyway, that is the tribe that my friend Merton Running Wolf is enrolled in as a member of. And so I just thought I would mention that news story as I introduce him here. Uh, first and foremost, uh, my guest, Merton, Dr. Merton Running Wolf, and I met and were classmates at the American Musical and Dramatic Academy way the hell back in the late 90s. And we then uh, we both lived and hung out together in New York City. We were both personal trainers for a short bit as we pursued our careers in entertainment and he has had a hell of a career he is active he has directed he has written and he has certainly gotten a whole bunch of degrees all at the same time he's now an assistant professor at the university of nevada reno he's got a phd from stanford a master's from nyu and also another master's of fine arts from University of Southern California School of Cinematic Arts and just an amazing guy who's led an amazing life and we've always been great friends we certainly lost touch for years but always kept tabs on each other that is for sure and it was great catching up with him for the second time on the podcast to talk about Rick Santorum's comments about a lack of contribution from Native Americans as well as a whole bunch of other issues we had uh, about an hour and 15 minute conversation I leave it all here for you now And I can't plug any social media because he is not on it, but I will forward him any emails, any thoughts you have. So email me and I will send them over to Mert, Dr. Merton Running Wolf. Right now, my email is, as always, standupwithpete at gmail.com. Here we go. Dr. Merton Running Wolf, everybody back on the show. The folks loved you (laughs) the first time, pal. It's great to get you back. Thank you so much. It was awesome, man. It was awesome. It was good to hear your voice, too, again. Yes. Uh, yes, connected for a while. Yeah, the, it, the, it's one of the great things about the pandemic. Which, by the uh, by the way, Mert, I've loved. Mm-hmm. You've loved, <laughs> loved the it. pandemic. Loved yeah, it, man. Hate like that it's ending. <laughs> <laughs> Outside of the meantime. nightmare of death <laughs> and fear, like there are things I miss and stuff, and I don't love wearing yeah. a mask and all that. I've just loved a lot of the lifestyle. <laughs> hey, man, seriously, like being able to like drive on the freeways without you know bumper to bumper traffic. Sure. Yep, loving it. Loving but the, the it. Thing, although. No, no. Uh-huh. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, th- I was just going to say that the thing that made me say that is that I've I've, mm-hmm. I've connected for the first time with a lot of people through the show, but I've reconnected okay. with people like you and it's been great. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and just, you know, a, 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 
really smooth segue is to go back to the freeway thing. Even though there's less traffic, there are people that are doing 250,000 miles an hour on the freeway. <laughs> oh, really? Which yeah. makes it a little bit more exciting, I guess. I mean, you can get from here to there faster, but you may actually be hit by see, a comet. Not, not see, no way, not <laughs> a comet. <laughs> see, I haven't even driven enough uh, mm-hmm. to notice that, but you also drive on those big highways out west too. I do, but I do. But I haven't yeah. even. Uh, yeah, I, the, definitely less traffic is a bonus, uh, though. Uh, anyway, so I want to. Yeah. There was two. Like I wanted to reach out to you to, to talk about just get your reaction to Rick Santorum's comments, and then I and then about the same right. time I want to reach out. You uh, had posted this article at Native News Online titled "Abducted and Erased by Hollywood's White Savior" or "The News of the World Abducted and Erased right. by." Hollywood's White Saviors, which is uh, Tom Hanks' new film. And then you talk about some other films in the industry as a whole. And it's a great article. So I want to get into all of that. But reminding folks uh, about you and your life and your past mm-hmm. uh, before we get to some of that. And in case they didn't hear our first chat, you grew yeah. up where? I grew up both in Montana on the Blackfeet Indian Reservation in Browning, Montana. Um, but my mom didn't want to raise us um, on the Blackfeet Reservation. She, at least she didn't want us to go to school there. So she was in Los Angeles and she didn't like Los Angeles, um, was on her way back. And she stopped in northern Nevada, Reno, Lake Tahoe, a place called Minden, Gardnerville, Carson City area, kind of northern Nevada. And she raised us in northern Nevada during the school year. And then during the summers, we would go back and hang out with my grandmother in Browning, Montana. Why did she Uh, not want to raise you on the reservation? Yeah, violent, violent place. So Browning, Montana kind of has a a reputation of being, you know, South Central, uh, Mm. East Palo Alto, <laughs> some of the, the worst part, Cabrini Green, but nobody really knows about it. Um, but I think the thing that she was worried about, not only just like um, the violence that was there, but I believe at the time, uh, Browning High School didn't have accreditation. Um, so oh, wow. like some some high schools um, on different tribal communities and stuff, you could get a certificate of completion, but you couldn't get a high school diploma. The certificate of completion would allow you then to apply to take the GRE. The GRE? No, GED. Sorry about that. Um, The GED. um, So then if you wanted to go on to college or if you needed something to show that you had completed high school equivalency, you could show them your GED. So that's a lot what a lot of tribal high schools will give you, or at least back in that that time. They did. What was I think there? Some still. <laughs> what was like when you compare it to when you compare Brownie, Montana, to some of those other neighborhoods? What I think about that those neighborhoods have in common. You said Cabrini Green and Palo Alto, and mm-hmm. what what else did you say? But the the point is, uh, there's like a lot of organized crime or gangs. Um, there is, well, yeah, there's um, well, in in some areas, and I know that. Um, there are like uh, there's drug trafficking that happens there. There's also the missing and murdered indigenous women's kind of pro- problem that we're facing right now. Um, policing is really, really difficult there because there's not a whole lot of funding there. But then there's also just a lot of like social issues, um, poverty, unemployment, uh, a lot of alcohol addiction and drug addiction, which lead to domestic violence, which, you know, can erupt into, you know, Things that I've seen that are just like, you know, we talked about a little bit about that is like how it manifested in my house. But I've seen stuff where, you know, neighbors going out and everything else and stuff, people, you know, running over, uh, uh, you know, usually using their cars as as weapons, like literally like going after people with their cars. You saw um, that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Like, I, I remember there was um, a father um, standing in the middle of the street and his like 12 year old son had stolen the family van. and on a residential uh, street, and this is on the res, this is in Browning, kid is doing like 70 miles an hour down uh, a 25 mile an hour thing, basically aiming for his dad. You know, his dad is like standing in the middle of the street saying, give me my car back, give me my car back. And the weird thing about that whole thing too is that the 12 year old had a baby, maybe a two or three year old kid in the back seat in the car seat, oh going just God. back back and forth, you know, and then um, ended up missing his dad and running into a... Uh, a brick wall, basically, uh, you know, kind of one of those uh, retaining walls that's probably made, like three or four feet tall and just ran into it. And then his father went over there, ripped open the driver's side door to get his kid and everything else and stuff. And um, the kid dove out of the um, the passenger side. But there are a lot of a lot of the people that are standing around Rajiv was like, get the baby, get the baby, because people were, you know, knew that there's yeah. this two or three year old kid in the back seat that was just strapped into a car seat. And so. As this was happening between the father and son, people like, you know, scurried really, really quickly to open the back of the um, the van and get the baby out. And, you know, as they were doing that and, you know, 
the father and the son were going at it and everything else and stuff and, you know, fighting over the keys and whatnot, you know, and, you know, trying to get the baby out before somebody jumped into that van and took it off again. As it's like, you know, basically, you know, gasping its last breath in the van because it ran, just ran into a retaining Jesus. wall. Yeah. It's just like, what was the kid okay? The little kid? The little kid was fine. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my um, God. But, but that's the kind of thing that you mm-hmm. would see commonly that, that kind oh, of man. violent. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. And the factions too, because I think that, you know, there's, you know, sometimes a, a misunderstanding of what's happening on the reservations and I remember, uh, old movie, Sister Act 2, they have this song in there. They're like, and the only place to live is on an Indian reservation. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you don't know that much about Indian reservations if, you've, if you're singing that in your song from the Sister Act 2 soundtrack. Wow. I forget the name. But it's like this conception, this like that these are utopian places that, you know, everything is, you know, fine out there. Everybody's in their sweat lodges getting high, <laughs> you know, <laughs> getting, using some peyote to just be one with the earth. Yeah, that's a bunch of crap, man. It's not that way, at least in my experience. There may be some people that get to enjoy that, but I've never seen it. Did you? Did, I was thinking about talking to you today, and I was like, you know what would be a really good question? Is when did you realize who you were in terms of your ethnicity, in terms of your tribal status, in terms of your history? Was it the kind of thing that your mom talked about, or was it just something that you had to figure yeah. out on your own? And, and is that still something that you're, you're, mm-hmm. you're thinking about? Like, was there a moment, was there a time when you, when you realized that you were, you were Blackfeet, you were mm-hmm. Native American, you were a, a, a tribal person. And, and, right. and with that came whatever you would want to, however you would want to describe it. When, when did you figure yeah. out who you were in terms of your ethnicity? Yeah, I think that, you know, we used to like play games and everything else and stuff like that. And I remember, you know, my uncles, my aunts, and my cousins, because we were, my mom is the youngest of her brothers and sisters. So we're the youngest cousins and the youngest nephews and my my sister and nieces. So we would get the crap knocked out of us by all of our, you know, in, in a fun way, in a teasing way, but sometimes it was aggressive. But um, my, I just remember my cousin holding me down and being like, you know, do the, the two knees on the arms and just holding you down. Yeah, that's that fun. Like, I love that. Like, yeah. Drip the spit into your, your oh, face. God, then yeah, suck it back up. Fantastic. But we would do this thing. And like, if you could like overpower, it was just like, take, take your fingertips and just drive them into the chest bone and make that hollow sound. Have you ever heard like, dun, 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 <laughs> and just keep it going. And, and I remember if I can, God, who's the chief. And it would be like, and just getting that shit knocked out of your chest. And it's like, and you had to answer, I'm the chief, I'm the chief, I'm the chief. And I'm like, mm. chief of what? Oh, I'm the chief of the tribe. What tribe? The Blackfeet tribe. You know, and you had to do this whole thing. And it was just kind of one of those kids games where either you're getting tickled or you're getting the crap knocked out of your chest until you actually got through the whole thing. So that was something that, but I think that more than anything else, my grandmother, who I'm named after, Myrtle, um, um, she went to the Chamawa Indian school and ran away in the third grade. And she ran from Salem, Oregon, all the way back to Warm Springs, Oregon in the third grade because she was taken away from her family at that time. Um, and she ran as more than 100 miles. And as a you know, basically a third grader, she ran because it was such a traumatic experience Jesus. for her. Um, you, well, you know, some of these structures that are present. Uh-huh. You cut out for one second. I don't know what happened. but Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry about that. Yeah. So my grandmother. Yeah, so she ran. Yeah, yeah, no, you told you said the whole thing where she ran Mm -hmm. away and then it just dropped for a second. That's that's uh, that's so that's Mm -hmm. what did she what did she represent in terms of when you right figured out? Yeah, she represented basically the last person that I know that actually could speak Ah. and so on Blackfeet and Wasco, but she could speak Wasco fluently, but she did. And the only time that I ever heard her speak in Wasco in the old language was when she was asleep and she was having nightmares and then she would sing and freak us all out because it'd be in the middle of the night. Um, and then she would call out to her old friends, ones that had died. Um, and for her, there was also a certain sense of, she was, uh, she was converted to Christianity, but there was a deep sense of who she was that was still tied to old traditional religious practices. And so she was this kind of like bridge between the old traditional ways and the forced assimilation. And she was afraid, you know, as a, as a grown woman, as somebody that was in her 60s, 70s, 80s, into her 90s, she was afraid to speak the old language. And so the only, and it, now it wasn't just fear. It also became this kind of like righteous stance that she, she took. She's like, oh, don't speak that. Don't, don't speak that way. If people wanted to speak 
in the old traditional way to her. Sometimes, you know, if they were old friends and stuff, she would like, oh, okay, and she'd tolerate it. But if it were new, if it were being handed down, part of the assimilation process from the boarding schools was to say, don't pass that on to your kids because they're not going to be, they're going to be ridiculed. They're going to be ostracized for doing that. And so my mom and her sisters, they all went to boarding school. My mom went to the Flandreau Indian School in, I believe it's South Dakota. Um, and she also went to Haskell and Haskell was a, an American Indian boarding school, a residential school, um, agency school, um, set up by the government and, you know, going all the way back to Carlisle in 1879, it was set up by the military in order to forcefully assimilate American Indian children. And we don't know, most people don't know anything about this era that lasted until the 1980s. Yeah. I don't know anything about it. And I was, as mm -hmm. I was reading your article and I was like, you know, I really don't know that much about what was done to native people mm -hmm. in this, in, in, you know, I, I've seen a lot of movies and I've, mm -hmm. I've talked to a lot of people and read some articles and grew up near the reservation, but like I learned a lot and you weren't really focused much on history, but you referenced a couple things as it relates to some mm -hmm. of these films. And I was like, wow, that happened. And, yeah. and my question to you is would, when, when did you learn? I mean, it's not like they, to some extent you're, you're saying, I mean, it, it was, it was not, uh, meant to be taught. It was not meant to be passed down. So how do you learn the history of your people right. uh, and mm -hmm. whether it be with with your people or or anywhere else? I mean, did you learn yeah. it in more in a more traditional academic setting later on in your life or did you learn things growing up? I, I did both. Um, so growing up, my sister and my mom really because because alcoholism and, and drug addiction played so heavily in my own life, my mother and my sister they went at it. It was just really just a hard rivalry between my mom and my sister. And it was just, my mom was a single parent. And when my sister got into high school, my mom shipped her off to the Flandreau Indian school. And then my sister also went to the Chamawa Indian school in Oregon, and then also to the Stewart Indian school in Nevada. So my sister had all these different experiences with American Indian boarding schools. Um, and I just was kind of assumed that that was going to be my path too when I went to high school. And it wasn't, but I was super familiar with, I didn't visit my sister when she was in South Dakota, when she was at Flandreau, but I did visit her when she was at the Chamawa Indian school and at the Stewart Indian school. And those places were rough, man. Like, rough and it wasn't like, yeah, like I went to visit my sister in her dormitories and it was just like straight out of like, like some hardcore film, man, like, uh, you know, like the violence, like just this gang activity, like there were gangs within the Stewart Indian school, um, different factions, just, you know, just a rough high school. And, but it was all Indian kids, you know, but there were, you know, they were mixed tribes. We were Blackfeet and Wasco, but there was a lot of Washoe, Paiute, Shoshone, but they were from all over. And so they would, whatever kind of like way they wanted to identify, whether it was athletic teams or whether it was their tribal homes, which was a lot of what, what, what happened, they would get into it. And I would watch, we would like, seriously, like, it was like this kind of like, you know, low income ghetto mentality. You just go and you kind of like kick back and you watch the street fight that's going on. And this shit was crazy, man. Sorry for cussing, that's but fun. it was like, you know, I just remember like following my sister as she and her friends ran out of the dorm to take on another like pack of, you know, students and girls, mostly girls. And it was like throw down, not kind of like shoving matches and everything else. Like it was like dirt and fists, hair and punches and everything. I was just like, and for me, that was kind of normal. And I was just like, what? And, but I was kind of like in my mind, I was like, this is how, how, how you grow up. This, you know, the story that I told last time and stuff like this type of violence was, was normal. And the expectation from my family, from my mom and from my aunts and uncles and everybody else was like, yeah, you better get get ready because this is what's in for, in store for you. And so, yeah, when I grew up, I was just like, all right, we're, we're going to go there. And yeah, you know, growing up in low income housing and stuff. And, you know, because when you move off the reservation, you don't move into the Ritz. <laughs> you don't move into like, you know, <laughs> Beverly Hills It's like, no, we are in, you know, subsidized housing and low, low rent districts and stuff like that, where a lot of times the way that you think about building any kind of like reputation is with your fists. And so this was the way. Um, but then, yeah, once I went off to um, college and stuff and nobody knew, nobody knew about like the boarding schools. Nobody knew about forced assimilation. And I would ha try to have these talks about because a lot of times, like when you and I were at AMDA, when I first went to New York City, I remember some of our, our classmates, one in particular, she was like, well, you know, Mert, you come from a very noble people. And I was like, well, I didn't say anything. I was like, what? What are you talking about? I come from a very noble, 
like, she, and she wasn't asking me that. She was telling me that. Hmm. And I was like, you see my mom on Friday nights? So like, well, what are you talking? You ever see my sister like throwing down and like all the stuff that happened at the, at, at uh, Chamawa and Stewart? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? And, you know, but I, you know, I get that it was this weird kind of fantasy that she had that was like given to her through whatever. And, you know, quite honestly, a lot of our classmates and a lot of our instructors, you know, we talked about Pearson. He still, a lot of them were like, no, you know, this is who you are. This is where you come from. And to this day, there are still a lot of people in academia who want to have that and in Hollywood who want to dominate the conversation with these fantasies of who they think we should be. And I'm like, yeah, that's not it. Do you ever think that you got out, that you escaped that? Because your success as, Mm -hmm. you know, in life by every Mm -hmm. measure Mm -hmm. has been, it's it's very atypical for where you came from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, am I right to assume that? Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. I think, well, you know, it's interesting that, you know, depending on which statistics you look at, some people will say up to like uh, 75% of American Indians don't live on uh, tribal lands anymore on their reservation. So it's 25%. But the ones that I do know, um, that are, that reside on tribal lands and stuff like that, I would say, yes, definitely. There is the way that I came up was definitely an exception to people who are, you know, who do reside on tribal lands or have resided on tribal lands. Yeah. I want to ask you, I want to get to that comment now that the, that the Rick Santorum comment, which was just Mm so, uh, deeply upsetting for, Mm-hmm. A lot of different reasons, but I wanted to get your take, obviously. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to find now the exact quote of what Rick Santorum said. Yeah. He said, America, and mm-hmm. he said, America was settled by people who are coming to practice their faith. We birthed a nation from nothing. I mean, there was <laughs> nothing here. I mean, yes, we mm-hmm. have Native Americans, but candidly, there isn't much Native American culture in American culture What's wrong with that? Why is that such a, why is that, where, why is there some, such a firestorm of, about saying right. we have Native Americans, but can leave, there isn't much Native American culture in American culture. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why is that and so I'd love bad? To get, yeah, I'd love to get your take on this, but let me off you since, you know, kind of, I'll, I'll take some of the question first, but you know, what kind of blows me away is that the National Museum of the American Indian is right there in Washington, D.C., that if he actually wanted to, and this is the part, and this may seem like a trivial point to some people, it's like, yeah, whatever, Mert, there's a museum there. I'm like, to be in that much denial when the evidence is so readily available to him specifically yeah. that he could actually walk out his door, walk down the block, and see the evidence. That is contrary to the statement. And for me, this is that kind of like willful erasure and kind of what i talked about you know in the the article was like a willful erasure so not only does it erase things like the navajo code talkers and the comanche code talkers who were so instrumental and we're talking about the culture we're talking about their language use during wartime that led to a turn of the tide in the in world war ii and it's just like and and world war one that it was also used there it's like how can you deny that and also the 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 kind of like the denial or the the forgetfulness that U.S. policy was to eradicate Native American culture. So it's like, you know, it's like punching somebody in the face and saying, you know, why are you bleeding? You know, it's just like, what are you talking about? You did this, man. Like yeah. the the cultural genocide, the erasure of American Indian epistemologies, philosophy, religion, language, all the cultural traits were targeted specifically by this government. So when you say, oh, well, there's no Native American culture that we can look to, and not only that, but it also obliterates any, like, archaeological or anthropological evidence. It's like the Ohio burial mounds, which, when they excavate, are they just show incredible artwork and incredible um, ideas of how to use the land and how, how structures were built and the engineering accomplishments of them, and to say there was nothing here when he could walk out his door down the block and see this evidence is just, it's so willful that it, it's, it almost for me, other than the fact that he's got a public platform and he, you know, I don't, you know, he's a public servant, uh, at least was a public servant that he could spout this off is just, that's the part that bothers me the most is not necessarily that he's completely wrong, which he is, but the fact that he has the platform that he does and that he held the position that he held, and to say this in such a blatantly arrogant way, kind of, it, I, I, I don't know whether to laugh or to cry. Yeah. 
It's, mm-hmm. it, I mean, I just, I think that it's just, uh, it's common for deeply religious in America Christians uh, mm-hmm. to try to talk about the origins of America being Christian or Judeo Christian, right. and we can talk about history and so on, but. And, mm-hmm. and obviously there's a huge influence from Judeo Christian teachings in, in America, but the kind of rewriting sure. that, that Jesus was America and America mm-hmm. was in the Bible. And more importantly, mm-hmm. I think what we're talking about, which is erasing native people from this country or any other country. I think, I think right. it, we, I think what he's doing is, is kind of a new type of genocidal rhetoric meaning mm-hmm. meaning the united states of american government tried to destroy slaughter indian people or or yes. change them as we were talking about mm-hmm. earlier make them assimilate forget their past mm-hmm. uh put them through these schools and, and teach them yeah. and that's what he's doing he's erasing right. history with comments like that and it's like yeah. a modern day r- rhetorical genocide and it's just such a right. brutal rewriting of history or or lack of understanding or caring about history and the way I like mm-hmm. it, and I read this on on the on the uh, on the whole show there today because I couldn't get you on, uh, but mm-hmm. I get you now. Is the National Congress of American Indians uh, statement, mm-hmm. and and their statement was just so unforgiving and scathing. But and, and mm-hmm. just in part, it reads: most importantly, how can anyone ignore what is arguably the the single most important philosophical development of human history? Environmentalism, the very concept mm-hmm. of man as one but animal but one animal with a complex ecosystem needing to live in harmony with nature and sustainably use natural resources. No idea is more fundamentally Native American and more explicitly spread by Native American peoples. There would be no yeah. national park system without Native American influence. And there's so much more in that response mm-hmm. where this oh, guy yeah, just, yeah, yeah. They, they, you know, this, this group uh, has this whole long list. So that's right. my whole rant on it. No, I, I, do th- I do completely agree with what you're saying. And I completely agree with what NCAI is saying. National Congress of the American Indian. I think that one of the things that he's also kind of saying is, yeah, okay, they did these things, but we don't value those things. Like, we're not really going to consider those contributions. Okay. And this idea also of devaluing or erasing and saying, well, they're not really feeding into it, you know, and now we get into this whole like battle over capitalism. It's just like, well, yeah, the, the different ways of being for many Native American peoples was you know, not a shift toward capitalism and self-serving narcissism, you know, like maybe that's redundant and probably is, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but the idea of that, it's all about the self. And it's interesting. I was talking with a, a colleague of mine and kind of like reading an article, just kind of leaned into it, but uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, food, shelter, clothing, and it builds from there. And this idea of that pyramid and all that whole thing. Well, there's some people that are unpacking this right now and saying that he actually took those ideas from the Blackfeet, from my actual own people. I, this was a surprise to me that mm. I just started finding out. And the reason why is because they were looking into this is that this idea of poverty, right? So for a lot of the people that they were talking to the, and, and the research that they were doing is that the Blackfeet and American Indian, Indian people are saying there is no concept of poverty. There is no concept of poor because as long as you have family, as long as you have community, as long as you have friends, you are never without. You are never without a home. You are never without food. You're never without means to take care of yourself because the community, family, friends will be there for you. So the idea of poverty isn't there. And that is so antithetical to the way that America is going right now. Like even just, you know, the conversation over masks, right? It's just like somebody was like, no, this is socialism. You expect me. And it's just like, they're like, the, con- the, the argument is so asinine to me i'm like it's not about you only you it's about taking care of others it's about taking care of each other yeah and yeah. why wouldn't we want to like do our best to take care of each other and they're like Be- f you that's socialism. because we don't care oh God, about oh. each other mm-hmm. that's right? the dirty secret like mm-hmm. a lot of us just don't care it's i would mm-hmm. go out it's it's but certainly what capitalism breeds. Right. And you don't mm-hmm. have to be that person in a capitalist right. society. But so it's hard not to be. You don't even know that you're becoming mm-hmm. that person. But nothing has laid bare the, the kind of soul and character of America more than the pandemic and more than the mask debate that you so rightly bring up or the vaccine debate. It's same thing, which is why should I get it? It's like it's not just for you. Mm-hmm. It's not just for you. Just like nothing is nothing. Right. It's like. Mm-hmm. insurance we're all in mm-hmm. the pool and if i'm healthy mm-hmm. you're never getting a car accident good i don't have then but but you might 
Like it's yeah. a community, and 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 I think you could uh, certainly look to native peoples all around the world to understand that as well. I mean, right, right. It, it's it's so not uniquely American, but American yeah. to just not care about each other's health and exactly. wellness, and especially if you're different. <laughs> Especially if you're different. I definitely mm-hmm. don't care about you if you're not like me. <laughs> right. No, that totally makes sense. And I think the thing that, you know, we hit on and we're talking about is, and what Santorum is kind of pushing for is like, those values are quaint, right? Mm. It's a nice idea to care about your neighbors, but that doesn't contribute anything to our, and he calls it culture, that doesn't contribute anything to American culture. And I'm like, well, then maybe we would need to rethink how we're defining American culture. Because right now it's ripping ourselves, we're ripping ourselves apart at the seams over everything, anything and everything. And I'm like, maybe we need to start thinking about these things in a different way. And for Santorum, he's like, no, no, you know, that's the, you know, whatever, you know, this shit about taking care of each other and all this other stuff. No, we're not going to go there. That's not an American value. That's not American culture. That's antithetical to what America is. And I'm just like, well, then, you know, keep it, man. And, And in that sense, maybe, bro. (laughs) you know maybe you're right then man like people that are interested in taking care of each other have nothing to contribute to the way that you want to see the world and that for me is sad and i ask is that the kind of elected official is that the kind of person that we want to put and give this kind of platform that says you're all out for yourself man good luck to you yeah you know and i think that you know when we when we look at what Maslow did and inverting this pyramid and saying, no, you know, the, the very first part is, you know, getting yourself food, getting yourself shelter and getting yourself clothing was about the individual. But, you know, what these scholars are saying is that, no, he, that was not the bottom of that was not the foundation to be laid. The foundation to be laid was an dependence on each other, that these connections, they offer meaning, they offer purpose, they offer you a way of being in the world where you're not alone. And we've stepped away from that and we devalue those things now, you know, and to, to a political kind of like angst, you know, and it's yep. like, and like you were saying about, you know, the different things, I'm like, take down all traffic signs. Let's take down, because somehow I guess maybe the, the mentality is, and of course I'm, you know, kind of like being exaggerating stuff here, but you know, things will just work out if everybody's out for their own, right? Like we'll come to an intersection and we'll work it out. You know, somehow we'll, we'll work it out. There won't be any assholes out there that will just bust, bust through that, you know, that intersection, you know, completely full of themselves to get into where they want to. No, oh, the stop signs are set up so that we actually have some kind of order so we can navigate through our day-to-day lives in a way where we don't have to be afraid for our lives at every moment. Right. And, and it's weird to think about that as a stop sign. But it's just like, no, we've agreed upon this, guys, for the benefit of all of us. That when we come to come to a stop sign, if you read about like the old, you know, some of the old ways that people used to navigate intersections before traffic lights and stop signs is like they would have to get out of the car, you know, honk this horn like three times. If they had a a firearm, they were supposed to discharge it three times you know, and climb back into their car and then they could proceed our, our physical world in a safer way. You can like toss that out and be like, oh, yeah, fuck it. You know, we'll all you know, we'll we'll figure it out. And we're all really good people. So we'll. We'll look out for each other. And it's like, no, no, no. We know if we got rid of these things that actually help us to navigate the day to day, we would be at each other's throats even more so. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Very well said. Um, I want to get to your piece uh, that you yeah. wrote. Very interesting. Uh, at Thank Native you. News Online. Everybody can find it linked in the show notes to today's episode. Uh, it's titled The News of the World Abducted and Erased by Hollywood's White Saviors. Now, the the, uh, the title's a little misleading. If you don't know the film, that's the name mm-hmm. of the film, News of the World. It's uh, Universal the world, yeah. Pictures, Golden Globes, Oscar nominated the Tom Cruise film. Many of you may have seen it. But you write uh, that the film seizes Native American history and identity to tell yet another Euro-American fantasy of America's fabled Wild West, this time stripping almost completely of American Indian presence. You then go on to admit that you like the film, Mert, uh, yeah. as a piece of you know entertainment and, and, and art, but but necessarily, I mean, given... It's like you're looking at it with two minds here. You're looking at it as sure. a PhD uh, mm-hmm. in film, and you're also looking at it as uh, a Native American. And, and, right. and you always... I mean, a lot of your career is about the under... Uh, presence, uh, representation, rather, the underrepresentation of na- actual Native peoples in mm-hmm. 
uh, film and entertainment and culture in general. So what, right. what happens in this, you know, you go on to cite a bunch of different I- examples as to what's mm-hmm. wrong with this film. So feel free to pick right. a few and, and tell me why it irked you, why it bothers you. Sure, more yeah, more yeah, importantly, yeah. not why it bothers you, but why it's, it's wrong, why it, ma- it mm-hmm. creates problems. Right, right, right. I think that, um, well, and just, you know, not to correct you, my friend, but um, it's Tom Hanks, not Tom Cruise. But yes, Tom Hanks. Did I say I Tom, Tom Cruise? Hanks. He did. Yeah. Yeah. No <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Tom Hanks. And I love Tom Hanks. You know, um, you used to do a, an, an amazing Forrest Gump impression back in the That's day. That's right. I, I, I sure did. <laughs> and I love, you know, I, but Tom Hanks is, <laughs> he is one of those guys that if he's in a movie, I will go see it because he's in it. Um, and I did enjoy it. Like, as were you a, with me as that a, Halloween when I ran down the street dressed <laughs> yeah. as Forrest Gump? I don't think I was. All right. I if you remember that, it would have been hilarious. I was dressed as Forrest Gump and we're in the village and, and I just sprinted just like he sprinted and screaming. And everybody in New York City was clapping, going, run, Forrest, run. Uh, <laughs> I was I screaming, I was I'm running, I am running. <laughs> Anyway, I'm sorry yeah, to throw you we, off there. No, we needed TikTok back then, man. We needed something. <laughs> yeah, <all time>. right. <laughs> you could have been a TikTok celebrity back oh, in the God. 90s, man. That would have been awesome. No, so I think that the idea, though, of like child abduction, you know, frontier violence, and then also this kind of weird move where um, he saves this Caucasian girl, this 11-year-old girl, from uh, being abandoned basically on the frontier. And, you know, what happens to her is – you know, my first watch of it, I really kind of like, I was like, whoa, what, what happened here? But she was raised by Kiowa, Kiowa Indians, and she only spoke um, Kiowa. Um, and so she became kind of like this surrogate for Kiowa Indians. But she, And then also they were, the whole charge was to bring her to an agency school, an American Indian boarding school, a residential school where she was going to get assimilated into Euro-American values and, and culture and language and everything else. And the thing that's never really explored in the film is, how traumatic of an experience this kind of, you know, there is this fear of the agency schools. They call them agency schools in the film. And they, the, the fear is warranted if you know about that history, but they don't cover that history at all. And so Tom Hanks is basically going to save her from the agency school or, or the sentence of going to the agency school. And there's this kind of like very wonderful kind of like, you know, very fabled fantasy of she teaches Tom Hanks how to speak Kiowa and then there's an exchange and he teaches her English words. And there's this lovely exchange of like cultural values centered around language and the ways of being and everything else. And I was like, oh, that's really nice. That is so not the way that it was. The boarding schools, um, the motto for them, for people that are not familiar, was to kill the Indian and to save the man, which basically meant to eradicate all traces mm-hmm. of American Indian culture, identity, epistemologies, religion, language, ways of being just get rid of all of that violently. And a lot of these schools, the Carlisle Indian school, the Stuart Indian school, different Indian schools, they had cemeteries next to them because a lot of these children did not survive that forced uh, assimilation process. It was violent. It was brutal. The Carlisle Indian school actually had what they called guard houses, which were basically those kinds of like um, those uh, tin uh, structures that are buried halfway into the ground that they would put prisoners in, in solitary confinement, and then they would leave them there until they changed their attitude. And so they would do these, do this kind of stuff to the children. But then there are also other, you know, um, accounts of they had hair winches on some of the tables where they would like take children's hair, the long hair, mostly for the females, and lay the child down and hold them down by their hair by putting it into this vice and this winch, and they couldn't move their head, turn their head from side to side and leave them there until their attitudes changed. And so these were the kinds of horrible stories. And then there's just like physical abuses. And so for me, a lot of, you know, the trauma that explained why my grandmother never spoke Wasco again or why my mom, you know, kind of like and why the reservation, you know, has these these um, horrible legacies of, of this trauma, of this violence. You know, for me, a lot of it does come from what I saw, you know, like I saw this stuff. I saw it manifested, you know, when my sister was like, in these fist fights, I was like, this isn't coming from nowhere. This is not only, you know, the way that the, this, this system works and the way that the, these, these uh, institutions work, but this is also, they've been this way for a really, really long time. 
And it was sanctioned, you know, and it was embraced. And I was just like, wait a second. So anyway, so the film, so he's saving uh, Joanna, uh, the Kiowa, um, the white girl raised by the Kiowa from this. And I'm like, wait a second, this is a story. This is innately a story about Native American trauma and history that now has Tom Hanks and 11 year old German girl (laughs) that are telling it. And then, you know, and then I saw one article that said, well, there's two scenes where there's American Indians. In it. And if you look really closely, you'll see that the first scene with the American Indians, they're actually not American Indians at all. They're digital doubles. They're, they're computer generated. And I'm like, OK, so they didn't even have to hire Native Americans for that one scene <laughs> because and there is there's, there's a sentiment because I've been in, the, you know, a lot of people are like, well, what do you know about this? You know, you're you're just an egghead Ph.D. from Stanford or you, you know, you went to USC and then NYU. I'm like. Dude, I also worked in the industry for a really long time, too. Right. And by the way, as a filmmaker, I can tell you can if you know what to look for, you can tell when they're using computer generated imagery and when they're not. It's not that sophisticated yet, but it's pretty obvious if you're looking at it and you're like, so they didn't want to. And some of the sentiment for hiring American Indians on American Indian themed work is um, and I can't tell you the name of the person. Oh, I could, but I don't want to. I'll just tell you what happened. Very popular Native American film that came out a few years ago. Um, a couple of my friends were working on it, and they were background. And, of course, the, the story was about a white savior that was in the wilderness and this whole thing, you know, save, being saved and stuff. And there was, like, an Indian attack. Um, and the director, who actually is, he's, a, um, he's not American, he's an immig- immigrant. Uh, he may be an American citizen now, but anyway, he, um, he's not from, originally from the United States of America, um, he was directing and he wanted the Native American actors, my friends, to rub dirt in their hair, on their faces and in their mouths and all over their clothes. Like he was like, I want you all to wallow in the mud before we get going on the scene. And they're like, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, you don't look, quote unquote, Indian enough. You don't look savage enough. You don't look like our fantasies of what American Indians should look like. So I need you to wall- wallow in the mud. And a couple of them went to him and they said, if you actually look at the journals of people that were, you know, Euro-American journals of people who were doing this, these people, these American Indian people that you're depicting had incredible hygiene. They had teeth as white as pearl. You know, this is this whole like kind of like way of talking about it. And he's like, I don't care. And he went off on the entire Native American cast. And he said, if you don't want to do this, I'm not making an effing um, an F and documentary told them that screamed at them. And I checked in with a few different people and it's it was, a bunch of people told me the same exact story. And he said, yeah. Um, and not at the same time, but he said, if um, I am not making an F and documentary and if you don't like it, you can leave. And I will get a whole bunch of other people in here who are not native American to do this for me. And so that becomes the sentiment that a lot of, a lot of like American He's, Indians who are in these movies yeah. have to de- kind of deal with. And so Adam Sandler's The Ridiculous Six, basically his associate director, when they had those people that walked off of that set, um, kind of like it made a lot of news for a little bit and everything yeah. else. Yeah. They were kind of told the same thing in a nice, you know, and the hard part about it is in the power structure. He was these, more like, well, if you don't want to do it, you don't have to. You don't have to be. But if you want to stay working on the show, you better do what I'm saying. Exactly. Right? I don't think. And and even like with the smile on their face, and there's actually a YouTube video where you can watch it, where one of his, you know, kind of like underlings, I don't know if it's associate producer or, or whoever, basically, and they said it's on YouTube. It's like right there. It's like, well, if you guys are too sensitive, you can just leave. <laughs> you know, and it's like mm. this kind of power structure, you know, is is so. Oh, it's just re-traumatizing, but it's also saying we have the power. We're not going to stop what we're doing. We're going to do whatever the hell we want to with it. And if you all don't want to be here, then bounce, man. And right. that kind of like power manipulation is so. Yeah. I feel like some people can talk about sensitivity or political correctness, but what I'm hearing you saying, really crying for in this situation, mm-hmm. is certainly representation and work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and 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 being authentic, but more importantly, mm-hmm. kind of why it matters isn't that you're sensitive; it's that your history has been erased. And so, when given mm-hmm. an opportunity with a big budget film or any mm-hmm. other piece of, of of literature or film or whatever, let's try to get it right. We don't yeah. get many opportunities. To get it right. So much mm-hmm. of the history has been erased, which is why someone like Rick Santorum can say what he said and people believe it. Uh, and, and so let's when we have the opportunity, let's get it right. Let's do right. it as accurately as we can. And mm-hmm. you go on in this article to talk about 
uh, uh, several other examples, uh, productions, mm-hmm. and even yes. SAG and AFTRA uh, ha- mm-hmm. uh, having uh, having SAG-AFTRA, um, SAG mm-hmm. AFTRA having an issue uh, in yeah. terms of uh, using enrolled Native American. What does it mean to be enrolled? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so the the idea basically is is. is um, there are people who are self-identified. So you have people like Elizabeth Warren or, and I don't even know why people will defend the Johnny Depp, Johnny, uh, jump to Johnny Depp's, um, kind of like very loose claim of having some native American ancestry. And he said, and the only thing that he said was on a talk show, a late night talk show. He's like, Oh, I think, yeah, a great grandmother back there somewhere that, you know, may have had some, yeah. I don't know, Cherokee. He made some just like loose and people have taken that to be like, See, Johnny Depp is Native American. It's like, mm, you need to listen to what he said because he didn't say that at all. He made this false claim. And he played Tonto in Disney's and he Lone Ranger. Tonto in yeah. the Lone Ranger, right? And Elizabeth Warren famously in this whole like fight that she had with Donald Trump, you know, just so the idea of self-identified is is very problematic when it comes to these representations. But SAG after has gone to this the whole other level, and they said it is now illegal, and they've said this for a really, really long time. They say that it's illegal to acknowledge or request proof of tribal enrollment when hiring or casting for any kind of feature film or network television, any any production that they sanction. And I was like, well, that's not true. Actually, the Supreme Court has ruled many, many times um, on this, and it's not true, whether it's um, working for the government, government contracts, or even in private uh, enterprises. You can acknowledge and request. And it's a lot more complicated than what I'm about to say, but you know, I think this kind of gets to the heart of it is if you want to, if you're a corporation and you want to have in-state hires, or if say somebody wants to set up a business, so Tesla, we can say here, if they want to set up a business in, uh, in Nevada, Nevada can say, wonderful, you're eligible for tax benefits. If you set up your business here and part of those conditions is, you know, a certain percentage, say 40% of your, your workforce has to be residents of the state of Nevada. That, that, that distinction is a, um, is a political identity. You are a resident, and that's why you can vote. That's why you have a t- certain tax structures. That's why you pay your income taxes. It's a political identity. It is not a racial identity. So being an enrolled tribal member is actually a political identity. It's not a racial category. But what sag after do says is no. It is a racial identity that you guys are arguing for, and that's a violation of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And the Supreme Court, like I said, has ruled on this several times, many, many times, and they said, no, it is not a racial category. Stop saying that. This is a political category set up generations ago um, for to help the, these, these communities. And sag is like, yeah, we hear you. We're not going to change what we're, what we're doing. And the funny thing is, is, a lot of people are like, well, that's just one organization. I'm like, SAG after is powerful. I've yeah. gone to meetings with the Writers Guild of America, the WGA, yeah. and they've echoed the same thing because they're like, well, no, SAG after set. And I've gone to studios sure. and been in different like, studio meetings, and they're like, no, 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 SAG after says. Hmm. And then Casting Society of America, the CSA, well, SAG after says. And then you just go on and you're like, wow, this powerful organization who is saying this false thing is so much a part of like this kind of like misconception and touting it even when they know. And again, this is Rick Santorum is like, you know that there is evidence to the contrary. And so, you know, this is for me, this is like, all you have to do. I even gave them the case law. I was like, here it is. I worked with uh, lawyers um, in Oklahoma, also at Stanford, um, uh, Tulane. So we, you know, kind of like found all this case law and the Supreme court rulings and everything else. And SAG, and I presented to SAG after I was like, please correct what you're saying. And they were like, nope, we're not going to do it. Uh, we're going to keep going with that. And I was like, what the hell, man? And for me, that's the same thing like Rick Santorum sitting in Washington, D.C. with the museum of the National Museum of American Indians basically down the street and saying, nope, not going to go. Not going to do it. I'm going to keep saying the crap that I'm saying. And I'm like, wow. Okay. This is what we're up against. Yeah, well, they're up against you, and you're yeah. one of the, unfortunately, I think, I don't know, maybe there are a lot of voices, but you're certainly one of the uh, most important uh, voices constantly. You've been you've been banging Thank on you. this drum for years yeah. to get yeah. more representation, and, and you go mm-hmm. on in this article to, to call out productions and people that you, you certainly wouldn't expect, like uh, mm-hmm. Ava DuVernay, who is mm-hmm. one of the most important people in the film industry for, for progress for, for black folks. Uh, right. She's done so much to fight, 
you know, mass incarceration and, and mm-hmm. so much. But she's got a new series on MSC called uh, NBC, you write, uh, called Sovereign. And you mm-hmm. write, it seems Native Americans are incapable of telling their own stories. DuVernay is partnered right. with a longtime Sundance Institute devotee who touts the idea that he and the famed film festival have mentored over 100 indigenous filmmakers. The pressing question you write is, so where are they? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's this this vehicle for them at mm-hmm. Sundance, um, mm-hmm. and yet they're not being utilized. They're not being. I mean, it's, yeah. it, it can't be that you guys aren't t- talented enough, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. Oh at, man. Yeah. At screenwriting, at acting, at mm-hmm. directing, at every of every role that is in the industry, it just can't be that. It it has to be right. what what it always is with entertainment. A lot of industries starting with networking and kind of who you know. Mm-hmm. But if you if you want to find somebody talented who is also Native American, it's not hard. Mm-hmm. You just right. you just right. you call one and they'll mm-hmm. know somebody, if not themselves. <laughs> exactly. like, like they yeah. could call you and you could give mm-hmm. them a hundred names. Oh totally. Yes. We I mean we could get to work right now on that series or any one of those series. And I also talked about Taika Watiti as who's a New Zealander who, you know, he'd be one of the people that um that Sundance says, see, there's an indigenous person. I'm like, there is a difference between the way that you're saying indigenous and who is Native American. Because when we're talking about Native American, people that are indigenous to the 48 states, the lower 48 states, but also Alaska and Hawaii, you're talking about people who are up against the the world's last superpower in terms of economics, politics, military. Like, we can't compete against that stuff. but when you talk about indigenous people from New Zealand, you talk about people from Australia, Central and South America, First Nations Canadian, they don't have to go toe to toe with the last remaining superpower in the world. We do. And part of what this, that last remaining superpower is doing is embarrassed and ashamed of its history. And they want to suppress it. They want to say, no, that didn't happen. You know, those boarding school things that he's talking about never happened. Look, Tom Hanks just made a movie about it. See, we were benevolent and we shared and we loved the the Indian language. And by the way, they didn't really contribute that much anyway. Like what we ask them to do, you know, again, rewriting history, we ask them really nicely to give up, you know, their ways because they were primitive, because they were savages and we gave them something better. It's just like, wow, these are these are these fantasies that get caught up in it. And quite honestly, unless you're somebody that sits with this stuff and, and has to deal with this stuff on the daily and see its manifestations, you're not really going to lean into these stories. Like one of the, uh, one of the things that happened to me when I was living in Los Angeles is I wrote a, I wrote a play about the Carlisle Indian, Carlisle Indian school, which is an adaptation of Chekhov's three sisters and people loved mm. it. Um, and uh, there was a dance element to it. And, this non-native choreographer choreographer came to me and she had her degree from Michigan and blah, 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 all the stuff. And she was out in Los Angeles and she was like, Oh, can I, can we collaborate on it? I was like, yeah, let's do that. And she was working with um, a guy that ran Sony pictures. I don't know. Again, it's hard for me to name names sometimes, but I'll, he ran Sony pictures at one time. And he, his, his son, um, I guess was in a school either in Bel Air or in uh, Hollywood or, um, or Beverly Hills somewhere. It was just a, a fancy school, elementary school. And she was like, I think that we can get him to, to give us financial backing to create this. And I was like, oh, wow, okay, let's, let's do that. Because he wanted his son, who he, again, self-identifies as having Native American heritage. He's like, I want my son to know about his heritage. Okay. And she brought it to him. And he said, I don't want to talk about the boarding schools. I don't want to talk about Carlisle. I don't want to talk about what happened with all this. But I really like the dances. So if we can do stuff where they're jumping around in feathers and the war paint and, you know, hooping it up with drums and that, then we can do that. And I was like, oh, so he doesn't want to talk about Carlisle Indian School, but he wants to do the dances, which the dances were this kind of like this way between the fantasy and the reality. And so that's what the dances are structured for. And I was like, okay, I guess we'll do that. So I didn't see her for like a month or so. And I was like, hmm, I wonder what happened. And I finally got in contact with her about a month later. I was like, hey, are you guys still working? And she's like, oh, yeah. She's kind of embarrassed. She's like, yeah, we're, we're still working on it. I was like, oh, you guys are still working on it. She's like, yeah, actually, we're getting ready to perform it soon. I was like, what? And she's non-native. She's like this whole white lady. And she's like doing it. And, and like they've changed it 
stripped it all of the Carlisle Indian School. And now it's like this just complete fantasy stereotypes of, of non-native dancers jumping around in feathers and war paint for elementary school kids in Los Angeles, showing them that this is authentic American Indian. Because the studio executive who ran the studios didn't want to talk about the Carlisle yeah. Indian School, but he wanted to perform the fantasy that he wanted to so that he could teach his son that. <laughs> and this is the stuff I'm just like, so yeah, I, I think it's, it's, I, I don't know if it's nice that Taika and Ava want to like help out, but this is the really tricky, you know, footing because I think that somebody like Buffalo Bill and his wild West show made a similar argument. Hey man, I'm just mm -hmm. trying to help him out. So he would take refugees from the, from things like the wounded knee massacre. And he would take the survivors of that and have them perform in the Buffalo Bill Wild West show as the marauding savages. And he would say, well, that's, that's how we get this to be authentic. That's how we get this to be accurate. Like these people were actually there. And then they would set up at the World's Fair in Chicago, they would set up an Indian village and you could walk amongst the real Indians that were really there. <laughs> and he would like stage these military campaigns to show the might of American military with the people who were actually there, right? And so, you know, two times a day, three times a day, you could come watch the Indian threat, you know, be thwarted and shot off of their horses and killed, you know, pay a dime or a nickel or whatever it was. And then after the show, you could walk among the village. And <laughs> this became kind of like the way that, you know, and, and you know, Buffalo Bill would say, well, I'm helping them, you know, right, right. they don't have anywhere to go. We're telling their story. This is authentic. This is accurate. This is, this is our history. And it was just completely a farce, you know, and then you can actually see some of these dancers. You can go online and type in the ghost dance by the um, Thomas Edison manufacturing company. And when they were in Chicago doing this, he brought some of those performers in and with early motion picture technology captured their dances. So you can see evidence of this. Like it's not, it's not hidden and you, you don't have to go, but yeah, you see these people who were brought in to make Buffalo Bill's wild West show fantasies legitimate through this false proclamation of authentic and accurate. And wow. You can see them. You just type in and you'll, you'll see them. Yeah. You, and if you just go, go to YouTube, type in Ghost Dance Thomas Edison, and you'll see the black and white footage there that they huh. filmed. Yeah. Uh, you know, you said, I just want to touch on one thing that you said, which is kind of very, I'm not going to say it's uniquely American, and I'm sure mm -hmm. other countries do this, but but other countries that have these these horrible histories of slavery mm -hmm. or, or genocide or 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 anything similar they don't mm -hmm. they don't erase them uh brazil right. germany mm -hmm. uh australia to some extent right. i mean there's always mm -hmm. controversy in terms of how they look back and if it's australia aboriginal peoples or brazil with slavery and germany obviously with the genocide of of the jews uh, but they mm -hmm. but they do acknowledge them in in sure. uh, in a number of different ways with actual standing memorials and laws and and the way that they teach history and right mm -hmm. now in america we're having an argument. I was just reading this before you and I got on the phone about mm -hmm. these these white folks are, are are really upset about the teaching of critical race theory. Or if people don't know mm -hmm. much about that, they might know about the sixteen nineteen project. And this and and so mm -hmm. what what people are upset about is teaching a certain version of history because there's there's many right. different versions, but right. teaching the version that was not taught or that was rewritten or that was erased mm -hmm. is what people are upset about. And I. I understand why they're upset because there's a certain kind of um, shame that comes with, but you don't mm -hmm. have to be ashamed. You actually don't right. have to be. The shame should come in ignoring it and not teaching it. And so my question mm -hmm. to you is, you know, how, how much different is America or how much work do we have to do in teaching the, the a more accurate version of history? The, you know, the kind of, you know, that I first learned about from reading Howard Zinn's The People's History, where mm -hmm. we didn't learn in public school in, in America, and certainly right. we still aren't. And so we're trying to teach it now, and people mm -hmm. are crying at town hall meetings about it. Mm -hmm. Crying. Right. Yeah. Oh, You're man, teaching yeah. my white daughters to hate themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, and I think that you hit the nail right on the head, which is this issue of shame, right? So the idea between shame and guilt, guilt being... I did something wrong and shame being I am something wrong. And so the idea of this kind of like permanent mark, right? That, oh my God, I come from a horrible people and I'm, you know, totally going to have to be a bad person for the rest of my life. Shame. 
guilt saying there were some mistakes that happened in the past. How do we correct this? How do we move forward? And right now, I think that because we're not having this conversation, people are just like, you want to, you know, you want to brand me and label me forever. I'm not going to teach my children that they're bad people. And I'm like, no, wait a second. This goes to some of the, some of the other questions that we were wrestling with too, was is America a racist nation? It has a racist history that slavery, genocide of the Japanese internment camps. There were events that definitely were racist. You know, the um, and this does this isn't you know talked about nearly enough, but in the 1920s and 1930s, before World War II, there was a mass deportation of indigenous Mexican people, and we don't talk about that. And you know, one of the things about w- with that with that action that happened was that some of these people that were indigenous Mexicans were also indigenous to North America, to the United States, which means Mm. that they were American citizens, which means that every single one of their children, grandchildren, all of their descendants would be American citizens, which means that some of the people that are trying to immigrate into into America today may very well be American citizens just trying to get back home. But we don't want to talk about those things. We don't want to unpack these things because it's far easier to fall into this kind of like hysteria and this fear and this anger of saying, no, they are rapists and murderers, and let's go ahead and label them that way. That way we can feel justified as as if we are the righteous people to keep out this foreign threat. They are not like us. They are not American citizens. And this becomes this kind of like weird, strange phenomenon. It's like, no, 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 we are good people. And the idea of coming to terms with our history, coming to terms with some of these racist things that happened over generations is not necessarily saying, you know, there are definitely some people, you know, I'll be the first to say there are some people that want to condemn and, you know, throw away the key and that whole thing. I'm not that way. I'm just like, look, if we're going to deal with the problem, move forward in a productive way, we have to define what that problem is yes. clearly, yes. clearly define what's going on so that we can move forward. Because when somebody says the people coming across the borders are drug dealers and murderers and rapists, that's not true. And we have to sit with that. We have to say, how is it, first of all, that this person is so easily able to manipulate this conversation? And what is he playing on? What are the historical legacies of brown people, of indigenous Mexicans, um, Mexican people to to this country that is so easily triggered. And we have to come to terms with that. Why is it that when we talk about other fantasies like manifest destiny, we are preordained by God to control this land from sea to shining sea, that when that's challenged, we get into a place of hysteria and panic. I don't I don't I, I have such a hard time with it. I have such a hard time understanding yeah. what, what, why white people are so upset about it. It doesn't do yeah. anything to you. It doesn't hurt mm-hmm. you. It, it, right. it, it only it helps everybody. It's you're not going to lose anything by acknowledging our history. Right. And this right. question that you know, of, of um, is America a racist country that Tim Scott's, you know, would try to, to answer after Joe Biden right. in his response to Joe Biden. The internet, he said, America's not a racist country. And then Joe Biden, Kamala Harris both said America's not a racist country. And then every other mm-hmm. broadcaster is like, oh, America's not a racist country. But and, and they t- started mm-hmm. unpack it. And and and, and we can talk about that you know, the, the complexity of, of that question or that word and let's not minimize it. But I, I have a hard time with it. It, To me, it's Mm -hmm. so simple and so obvious. Of course, America is a racist country. Mm -hmm. Of course we are. Look how we were Mm -hmm. founded. The the, Mm -hmm. the genocide of native Americans and the enslavement of black Africans. And then you go all the way through the civil war and then Mm -hmm. the civil rights era. And when did we stop being right. racist. When did we right. stop? That's mm-hmm. my question. We, mm-hmm. if we were, if we could, I don't. We probably can't agree that we ever were with some of these uh, right. nut bars mm-hmm. and idiots. <laughs> I just saw mm-hmm. a clip uh, of of people down south saying, you know, the slaves were treated well, and I mean, a lot of people believe that stuff. <laughs> yeah. But so right. we're, forget yeah. about those people. But if mm-hmm. if we can't agree that we were, if we mm-hmm. can agree that we were, mm-hmm. we started as a racist country. My question to folks is, when did we stop? When did it stop? Right. Mm-hmm. And it and the answer is it hasn't. It obviously, hasn't. it's yeah. it's murder. It's not tough for me. Like right. that, no. the answer is America <clears throat> racist country, of course. And if mm-hmm. it's not, the question has to be when did we stop being? Right. How do you right. see my diatribe, my framing mm-hmm. there? Am I right. am I simplifying right. it too much? No, I think that what what you're asking also is how have how how does it manifest itself, and how did it manifest itself before? 
And how is it different now? Right. And when right, did that right. shift happen? Because right. right now, I think that we can also say, how is racism manifesting itself right now? And so when we see, you know, policing actions and we look at the data, I'm not even talking about instances, you know, specific instances, which we should definitely talk about. But I'm talking about, you know, when we look at the data, we can see that there's inequity there. When we look at, um, you know, the prison industrial complex, we can see that there's inequity there. And the, there has been a lot of research that looks into these things. And to turn your eye from that to say that it's not manifesting but, but, in uh, unequal ways based on race, that's completely wrong. Yeah, I know, but even huh? if we want, even if they want to have their data... And, sure. and talk about well, more white people are killed by police. That's the most commonly cited point. Mm-hmm. And it's right. and, and uh, like I'm always I always get, uh, think that we shouldn't get caught up on police killing people. We shouldn't get caught right. up on the death. We should really right. focus on the abuse, the constant, constant mm-hmm. brutality of uh, right. uh, that happens at arrests and against mm-hmm. white people too. We have a huge yeah. problem with policing. But put that aside, Merck. To me, if the question is, are we a racist country? The answer has to be, are we making it harder for black people to vote or mm-hmm. certain people to vote? And the answer is yeah. yes. In state after state, hundreds of laws right now as a result of the wrong guy winning. Right. That's yeah. the most race. That's what Dr. King and the Civil Rights Movement of the 60s fought for and won the Voting mm-hmm. Rights Act, which has been repealed. So, yeah. yes, mm-hmm. <laughs> the answer yeah, is I yes. <laughs> yes. I think if you're that, making you it know, harder yeah. for people mm-hmm. to vote. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I agree. I completely agree. You know, and I think that, you know, the, for me as, you know, as an instructor and a, as somebody who works with students and stuff is that. Let's drill down and let's get into those specifics and then let's deal with those specifics, you know, because I think that, you know, kind of choosing a side, you know, as much as we can, this idea of like kind of like not wanting to deal with what the problem is, is for me, the 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 real linchpin, all this stuff, which is to say, look, guys, we have this issue that is going on. And yes, we are repealing the Voting Rights Act. How are we doing that? And let's stop that from happening because it was progress that needed to happen in the 1960s. And we are moving backwards as a nation. And not only is this inequitable, not only is this intolerable, but we are actually creating more division in this country that we are tearing ourselves to pieces from. And there's a better way forward. And asking the question, how and why, you know, asking that question, why, which I know a lot of people are like, no, I don't want to know why, you know, F that, let's just do it. I'm just like, If we don't ask how and we don't ask why, then we'll never get into a ways of answering these questions that are going to be productive. And for me, you know, one of the things that I was telling my students that I think I'm doing better now, but, you know, it was tough for me sometimes because a lot of my students, they come in and they're ready to fight. You know, they're ready Mm -hmm. to go. And they think that my class and I um, not only do I talk about, you know, a lot of Native American issues and stuff like that, but I teach race, gender and media. And so I look at like inequity in terms of uh uh, gender, um, able-bodied versus disabled bodies, right. um, and race across as many different spectrums as we can. So we touch on all these things, but more than anything else, this is like, we have inequitable systems that are going, that are operating on many different levels. And if all we do is point fingers and blame and come in here pissed off, we're not going to get anything solved. And I, I tell my class, I'm like, dude, guys, I get it. You want to turn this class into social media comment section. <laughs> You know, I'm like, we're not going to do that. We're not going to just come in here, wait for our pet project, you know, to come up and then flex our nutsack to try to like prove that we're right and everybody else is wrong. And I tell them, I was like, by the way, whatever it is, wh- whenever we hit your jam, whatever, you know, topic or subject or, or, or a thing that we're going to cover, you have an expertise on share that with us. I, I hope to learn from you. I hope to learn from what you know. And I hope to learn from what your, your experiences are, because I haven't experienced everything and I don't know everything. Sure. So please help, sure. help me out. Help me out to understand. But what I do expect you to do is if and when we do do your thing, step for, forward, share what you know, share what you've been through. And when you were not there, I expect you to give the same respect to other people who do have more knowledge and do have more experience with that area of our society than yep. you do. And I don't want you to like come in here trying to shout them down just because you're pissed off or just because we've gotten into this way of being with social media and yelling at each other. I'm like, it's not helping, guys. I mean, I get it. And you want to do that, but it's not helping. It's hard. It's hard for people to listen when they when they think they know everything, especially oh, totally. if, you, if you're young. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I mean, and me included, but I, I will say I don't I'm I'm not really that interested in hearing from conservative white rule mm-hmm. folks that mm-hmm. much because mm-hmm. that's how I grew up. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm like, I, I that I don't need to hear that perspective as much. So right. this idea of we need to listen to each other. I'm like, no, I need me, mm-hmm. Pete Dominic. I need to listen to the people that I'm really not familiar with and that I don't know. I completely right. understand the whites. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Believe me, I do. I mean, I understand poor yeah. rural whites right, really right, well. Yeah. I totally yeah. do. What they right. don't understand mm-hmm. is blacks and Native Americans yeah. and Asians. Mm-hmm. And I didn't either until yeah. I moved to New York City, really. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Until that's when mm-hmm. my education began. And I've been on this listening to ever since. And it's fun. Yeah. And it's interesting. Yeah. And it's not hard. It's just really great to listen. Which is Mm -hmm. why I'm so glad that we got to listen to you for about an hour today. So much fun, dude. I don't remember you being this smart. (laughs) Were you this smart when when we were in... I was born this smart. Oh, hell no, man. No, no, it took a lot of work. It took a lot of like effort and everything else and stuff. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, some some of the people who are critical of what I'm saying and everything else and stuff. And like I told you, you know, about a half hour ago is a lot of people like... He's an egghead. He only knows books and, you know, essays. Yeah, no, and no. I'm like, no, nah, man, not only did I go through like, you know, the industry and working for Disney, ABC, working for all these different places, being in movies with Brad Pitt, and blah, 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 the whole thing, you know, all of that stuff. Um, but going through our training, too, you know, a lot of what I'm shaped by is also what happened in the earliest days of my formal training, which was at AMDA and in New York City. So all of that. But beyond that, yeah, man, I was you, a kid that got yanked out of bed and thrown on the ground and had a knife held to my throat for an hour by a drunk ass native dude from my own res that was like paranoid that somebody was coming to like, these are all the things that are go into it. And I'm like, let me like try to wrap my mind around this. Otherwise, it's going to drive me insane. And mm-hmm. I will go down the same path of my brother and my sister who struggle with their own right, addiction, right. substance abuse. And I was like, I get it. I get why they do that. You know, this is some hard stuff to, to sort through. And when I think about my brother, my sister, and this is why I think listening is, it's not just listening for listening's sake and, and kind of like taking that thing on, but it's also, I want to have a better relationship with my brother. I want to have a better sure. relationship with my sister. Sure. And they're in a lot of pain. And part of me listening is not necessarily letting them just kind of get it off their chest. It's like, I want to move closer to you, homie. Yeah. I want to know, you know, what's going on. And right now, when you listen to an alcoholic or you listen to, a, a, you know, somebody who's on drugs, hard to get through, man hard to get through. Yep. But yep. at some point, my hope is, is if I show them that I'm willing to, to reach out to them and that it's cool, we can actually have some kind of salvageable relationship. And yes, I'm talking about having a relationship with somebody who is clearly an alcoholic, who is clearly a drug addict. And I have to ask myself, do I want to have a relationship with them? And the answer for me when it comes to those two is hell yes. And so I'll hmm. keep trying to do what I, what I can do. I will listen to them try to form a better relationship with them, even though what they talk is kind of crazy. Yep. I'm, I can't stop, man. I can't stop because here's the, here's the alternative. Then I become like them. Yep. Well said, you know, so that's where, that's where I'm coming from with a lot of the other stuff. thing. That always, I, yeah. Mm-hmm. I wonder so. if, um, I don't know what your experience was with, with gay folks before New York mm-hmm. city and acting school, but you and I both mm-hmm. went to this acting school and then worked yeah. as personal trainers and yeah. like, Everybody was gay everywhere. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And yeah. at, at times I was really uncomfortable at times there were all kinds of weird mm-hmm. things that happened, but mm-hmm. man, did we get forced to yeah. learn about every culture, including LGBT, including mm-hmm. gay culture, you know, being in this industry and being in New York city and in fitness mm-hmm. too. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like, did you learn did you, a lot? Oh, totally. Oh man. Yeah. I, I mean, think that's you had gay clients. clients. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And there was one and, you know, he was, uh, and I, I, I think he may still be alive, but, um, um, older gentleman and he had, um, shoulder repair surgery. And he was telling me that, you know, for most of his life, he identified as a uh, heterosexual, had, <laughs> had a wife, had a son. <laughs> I think he may have ha- had some other. And then, you know, when he was in his mid fifties or so, he just kind of like, you know, had a moment where he's like, I need to be honest with myself. I need to be honest with my family. And he said, yeah, I, I am gay. Ended up getting into a, a divorce from his wife and it was amicable and everything else and stuff. And, you know, was in a new relationship and everything else. And, you know, we just talked about these things in a very cool way because, yep. yeah, I spent a couple hours with him every week, you yep. know, tw- two or three times a week. And we would talk about this. And, you know, and the cool thing also, I think about being a personal trainer 
for me was that we were there for wellness. You know, not only, you know, people wanted to look good and everything else, but a lot of the people that I worked with were people that were dealing with either shoulder replacement surgery, hip replacement surgery, high blood pressure. A lot of people had diabetes and stuff like that. And I really enjoyed working with them more than like celebrities. You know, right, right. Or people that were, yeah. Yep, yeah, yep. yeah, 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 for and sure. Because so you learn about so much mm-hmm. about them and their needs and, mm-hmm. and yeah. It's a great and so point. I, I, visit, I visited him because he had shoulder replacement surgery and everything else and stuff like that. And it was one of the most rewarding relationships that I've had in my life to where, you know, I, I, I came in and I believe he, he had remarried and his husband came in and was right there and everything else. And when I came to visit, I was like a member of the family and it was very, very different from the way that I grew up. And I am so thankful for being, you know, in those areas and in those, those situations and everything else, because, um, yeah, this, this person has touched my heart in a way that, you know, I was just like, Holy crap. I never in a million years thought I, but, you know, to your point is without going out and without, you know, exploring, you know, what it means to be in places where you're going to bump into people that are different than you and how you go about having those interactions makes a world of difference. Not a, at all that, you know, I was expecting that or that I went in there as some benevolent person like I'm going to be. But it was an openness. Yeah, and you're just, forced into it when mm-hmm. you're when you're put into a place where there's a tremendous amount of diversity, especially if it's mm-hmm. at your job. Yes. It's not a benevolent thing necessarily. It's like, do mm-hmm. I want to make money? Do I want to exist mm-hmm. and succeed in this industry, in this, mm-hmm. in this city, in this place? Well, then I'm going to have to learn a lot about right. people that are very different than me mm-hmm. and, and, and provide them however I can with whatever they need. Right. And I think that one of the things about being a personal trainer too, is like at some point for me to do it as long as, you know, we did and we say that you, you have to ask yourself because I'm sure you saw this a lot. Is people that went in to just like make these false promises. Oh, I can get you some ripped abs in yeah, you know yeah. two weeks. <laughs> you know that they were hucksters. You know that they were telling these people a bunch of bullshit because you cannot actually get somebody right. to yeah. have that in a couple of weeks. Yeah, and so you start asking yourself, "Am I in this for the long haul with this person who looks to me to help them get to where where they are now and where they want to be?" And for me, that's why I liked working with people who had underlying health issues. I was like, I want to help them with that. And that's what's rewarding to me. It's not about, you know, hanging out with some celebrity, getting them ready for their next Marvel movie. Like, I was like, no, nah, that's not rewarding at all for me. But having these real relationships with people that, you know, and, and I did it. You know, I went to the hospital. You know, I talked to his, his surgeon and then, you know, worked with the, um, with the um, physical therapist afterward. And we kind of like collaborated. And that was that was freaking awesome, man. I loved it. Yeah, I had I, I think what I learned the most was working with people who were severely overweight mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. I I would like just I would be forced to learn how they would gain and, and, and keep putting on mm-hmm. weight and all mm-hmm. of the emotional stuff. Like it's so easy to be dismissive about people who are overweight. Right. But when you work with them as their trainer, especially mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. they and, and often they would be extremely honest because you would try yeah. to get them, you'd almost demand it. But you try. You got to mm-hmm. tell me I'm your personal trainer. I'm not going to judge you. I'm, let's work on this. I'm not your yeah. shrink. But but nonetheless, I learned so much about mm-hmm. how and why people struggled with weight. That wasn't yeah. something that I ever or still had had mm-hmm. an issue with. And I just really got a lot. I learned I mean, more than any other population about Mm -hmm. people who struggled with weight issues and and being uh, not sensitive, but also just learning about it. And I think, you know, the, and the other side too, is people who are dealing with like eating disorders, because we dealt with those, those people as well. And I also think that, you know, high level athletes who put so much into how their body performs Mm. so much of who they are in their own worth in it. So a lot of the times when I would work with, you know, again, not wanting to work necessarily with celebrities, but also working with people who are training for like marathons or, you know, wanted to like get better at, you know, whatever event that they were doing in terms of athletics and to work with them on this kind of like more psychological level and say, you know what, you know, you may be putting a lot of like overemphasis on your personal worth into, you know, your body. And we need to work on that. You know, I'm not saying that you were, we don't want the best for you in terms of like what you're able, your body's able to perform, but right now what's standing in your way is your anxiety yeah. over thinking that you have to be perfect and brother man or like, you know, sister, you know, no, let that shit go yep. and let's try to get the best that you can. And when you let that go, man, I could see, I saw people like seriously move to another level For sure. when they let the anxiety go. I was yep. like, cool. Now we can actually get to work on the thing because now it's not caught up in who you are. 
And I think that that was one of the things that I saw people, you know, open their eyes. And the, but quite honestly, we're all, we're still human beings too, you know, it was like, that was tough work. You know, it's not like we came in again, we're not like, you know, the, the Dalai Lama sitting on the mountaintop, you know, come to us and we'll bless you. It was like, no, this is, this is hard work. And I think that that's the same thing with like, you know, talking about, you know, film and television production and, you know, being able to, to make all these advances. Like, I think that a lot of people, you know, when they think about minorities or underrepresented communities in media production, they're like, well, yeah, I could run around with a cell phone and put some stuff on YouTube as well. I'm like, that's not what I'm talking about, man. But I think of all of these things, whether we're talking about race relations or how we balance all of these things out, we are not in a place as a society where we're willing to invest in asking some of these deeper questions about, you know, like you said, with race, are we racist? Yeah. And we need to ask the, diff- the difficult questions of how the hell did we get here and how the hell did we get into a place of such deep denial about it as well? Because these are, these are the hard work. This is the hard work. And so for me, oftentimes when I talk about these things, I do equate it to athletics. I'm like, you know, you wake up in the morning and you put on your running shoes and you go out there and you try to do better, a little bit better than you did yesterday. And quite honestly, you know, that sounds, you know, trite and that sounds, you know, you know, kind of like, like bullshit, but I'm just like, but that's the best that you can do. It's not, you're not going to wake up, you know, one day and be able to win the marathon. You know, it's going to be like, you know, you're not going to go out there and be able to like. No, that's a great. I I love it. It's a great way of putting it. It's it's not about winning. It's about what's the best that you can do today. And and by the way, every day is not going to be the best. I I had on Friday was the day after my uh, second uh, vaccination and Mm -hmm. the side effects were not bad, but they were they made me (laughs) lethargic and Mm -hmm. I did nothing. I had no motivation yeah. and I felt mm-hmm. emotional, like so much guilt. I never have a day mm-hmm. where I do nothing. Never. Yeah. And yeah. like I, ha- I kept having get, to get permission from ve- my wife. It's mm-hmm. like, it's fine. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. And I just felt so much guilt. And it was like, just going back to what you said, you don't have to win today. You got to mm-hmm. do the best you can today. And that, yeah. might, not, and that might mean nothing. It might yeah. mean nothing. And I, I'm still, yeah. I'm still grappling with the fact that I did nothing uh, three days ago. <laughs> yeah, right? And I do think that, you know, like you were saying about this idea of like, are we racist? Part of it is also sitting with it and being like, yeah, yes, we have some of these deep problems that are going on today and not doing anything about it, but just other than accept it. Rather First than accept it. Exactly. Yeah, we are a racist nation when we are based on and built on a lot of racist practices and precepts that are still manifesting. Yeah. Sit, breathe, guys. It's going to be OK, because if we come to terms with it, then we could do something about it. Yep. But if we keep denying it, you know, it's it just gets know, it's worse. Like, yeah. It, well, it's like the addict, right? It's like the alcoholic. Yes. It's like the drug addict. That's just like, yeah. I ain't got a problem. Like, no, it's a great, it's, it really is a great parallel. I don't think I've ever really mm-hmm. talked about it that way, but it, you're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. It's first yeah. acceptance and admission and we, and, and then we can start talking about what yeah. needs to be done and how we got here. Oh, yeah. uh, dude. So great talking to you. It's been over an awesome uh, hour, you. 20 minutes. I can't thank you enough. Oh yeah. Yeah. My pleasure, man. Always, always. There he goes, Dr. Merton Running Wolf. Let me know what you thought of that conversation. Email me, standupwithpete at gmail.com. I didn't want to add anything else to today's show because we talked for over an hour and I did a very long news segment, but I've got great interviews coming up with Nicole Lynn Lewis, who wrote an awesome book called Pregnant Mom. And then Wajad Ali is scheduled to join me this week. And I would love to know who you'd like me to talk to. Got some great guest ideas for this week, but those are the two that I'm planning on for sure having. Uh, and uh, as always, Christian Finnegan, Rick Smith, I mentioned earlier. Let me know who you want me to have on, what you'd like to have discussed. I hope to see you Thursday night, every Thursday night, 8 p.m. for the virtual happy hour stand up subscriber hangout. And anytime, check in on the Discord platform. I hope you've gotten vaccinated and so are the people that you love. And I really appreciate you listening and supporting this daily podcast. Tell your friends, folks. All right, that's it for me. I am done. I'll talk to you tomorrow. But let's listen now to our favorite singer-songwriter, John Carroll. And I say that because he wrote a song, the theme song for the show. He's a Grammy Award winner and just a great all-around guy. Here he is, John Carroll with Stand Up, taking us out. Stand up, stand up, show your face.
of every color, yellow, black, red, and brown. She's the place where every lost child will finally be found. There's only one thing to do before we stand our ground, and that's stand up. Change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We gotta let him know it's his time to go to make it clear when all we hear is a lie. The scene of that experiment If you stand up Alright We got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way You know how Don't be toes up You got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance To no ones and try Rise up Show a to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up 